bike with a fresh charge, so I'm hoping it should last at least four hours. I think it's four hours, that's all we need, yeah. I think I've heard... <laughs> I, look, I, I have no problem being, being honest with what I don't know. I'd rather, I'd rather be honest with people than try to bullshit. So.
champion for our series featuring the Pacific Tigers and your UNLV Hudson Rebels. The Mountain West Conference and UNLV are committed to the ideals of good sportsmanship and fair play. We ask all persons to please show respect for the opposing team, game officials, and each other. Persons throwing objects or participating in other acts in conflict with good sportsmanship and fair play are subject to ejection. Your cooperation is greatly appreciated. And we would also like to remind you that Earl E. Wilson Stadium is a non-smoking facility. Designated smoking areas have been provided for you behind the grandstands area. Also, please be reminded that flash photography is not permitted. 
nine, John Howard Bobo. Batting second, the left fielder, number one, Ben Nimivant. Batting third, the shortstop, number 20, Chaz Myers. Batting fourth, the designated hitter, number five, Jeremy Lee. Batting fifth, the second baseman, number 27, Andrew Sloan. Batting sixth, the catcher, number 10, Jacob Wheat. Batting seventh, the third baseman, number three, Ryland Evans. Batting eighth, the right fielder, number 14, Tony Otis. Batting ninth, the first baseman, number 12, Sweden Casagrande. And pitching for the Tigers, the right-hander, number 38, Jacob Smith. The Tigers are coached by Chris Rodriguez, assistant coaches Ben Buckner and Elliot Kribbe. Volunteer assistant coach Garrett DeGallier. And their graduate student manager is Sharon Silva. UNLV Hustling Rebels. Batting first, your center fielder, number 25, Rylan Charles. Batting second, your designated hitter, number eight, Santino Panaro. Batting third, your catcher, number five, Jacob Sharp. Batting fourth, your third baseman, number two, Adarian Williams. Batting in the fifth spot, your left fielder, number 47, Austin Grizzik. Batting sixth, your first baseman, number 14, Cade Higgins. Batting seventh, your right fielder, number 22, Alex Pimentel. Batting in the eighth spot, your shortstop, number 23, Paul Myro. And batting ninth, your second baseman, number three, Gianni Horvath. And starting on the mound for UNLV, the left-hander, number 11, Josh Sharman. The Hustlin' Rebels are coached by Stan Stolte, associate head coach, Kevin Higgins. Assistant coach, Corey Vanderhoof. Volunteer assistant coach, Justin Jones. Graduate student managers, Chase Maddox and Nick Rush. And their director of operations is Chris Prescott.
heard the voicemail. It was hilarious. It was like a six minute voicemail. For the second time in the 2023 season, welcome into another edition of UNLV Hustlin' Rebels Baseball. Along with the coach Dan Dolby, I'm Matt Neverett, bringing you today's action from the Earl, Early Wilson Stadium. Here on the campus of UNLV, as the Hustlin' Rebels look to remain perfect to begin the 2023 campaign, they'll turn it over to Josh Sharman today. Sharman getting loose ahead of game two out of 55, the second of 25 non-conference games for the Hustlin' Rebels, who defeated the Pacific Tigers in a 14-6 final and Dan, a lot of offense, a lot of really good pitching. There was a lot to like in last night's win. Yeah, absolutely. In talking to Coach Stolte and the staff this morning, though, it's all about, you know, baseball playing 56 games a year. You got you to gotta wipe that one, right? You got to come out today like you're starting the season all over again. And I think the mentality of the hitters, at least, and then hopefully the pitching staff has that kind of mindset like, let, let's go. Last night was last night. What are we going to do today? The Desert Oasis High School grad Josh Sharman toes the slab for the first time on this season. The fourth year player for UNLV is set to make his 32nd career appearance, 26th career start. And he'll do it against the center fielder John Howard Bobo in from the right. Pacific rocking the alternate black tops today with the road grade pants. First pitch just down low. We're underway at 105 on a picture perfect Saturday afternoon here in Southern Nevada. And no wind to speak of as the Hustlin' Rebels look to remain perfect against Pacific today. Bobo takes a called strike one by our home plate umpire, Alberto Ruiz. Tim Vesey down the first base side. Across from him, Tyler Schmidt down the third base line. Over in shallow right center field, the second base umpire, Anthony Prater, watches on. Charmin deals out of the full windup and misses away with the curveball. A five-pitch mix for the left-hander out of Las Vegas. A fastball in the mid-80s, along with a cutter. Also throw a slider, a curveball, his main secondary pitch, and a changeup that he'll throw often to right-handers, looking to move it away from them and induce some weak contact. Fastball here, fouled straight back by John Howard Bobo, the center fielder. We have Jacob Sharp doing the catching once more. He was great in his debut, but over at first base, Kate Higgins even better in his debut yesterday with four hits, including a home run. Yeah, Sharman's a guy that the, the Rebels are really looking to, to count on this year, coming and get a lot of innings in. He's not going to overpower you, but he's got a lot of good pitches that he can locate. One of the best pickoff moves in all college baseball. A crafty left-hander, 4-3 record last year with a 6-3 ERA, made 16 outings, including 10 starts. Lost over 75 innings last year. He was the leader in the clubhouse in terms of longevity on the hill. He's got a 3-2 count to the leadoff batter, Bobo, who takes a changeup just inside. Charmin thought that was strike three, but instead Pacific's leadoff batter reaches on a long full count walk. Brings up Ben Nemavant, the left-handed batting left fielder, who led off the day yesterday with the base hit. You notice after that, after that first uh, at bat by Bobo there, last night they were first pitch swinging many times at the plate. Tonight, I may, they may see them be a little more patient with a guy like Sharman on the mound because he's not going to try to overpower you. Pacific played it six runs on 13 hits as that squares to bunt here, knocks it foul straight back on the on deck circle as the shortstop Chaz Myers had to lean out of the way. The big thing for Pacific last night was that they gave up runs in bunches. The Rebels scored in every inning from one through five, but they also left 13 runners on. The hitting was scoring with runners on base and in scoring position just wasn't there. And with the runner Bobo off first, Sharman comes set on nothing and one. Fires one over to first. There's that pickoff move you mentioned as runner Bobo is back in standing and safely. Bobo with eight steals and nine tries last year. Good speed at the top of the line at the center fielder. Higgins holding on at first. It's the shortstop Paul Myro up the middle. Away from the bag at second is Gianni Horvat. The runner breaks. The fastball's in there for a strike. A good throw by Sharp is a bit late as it bounces to the shortstop Myro. John Howard Bobo in safely with his first swipe of the season. With a runner on second, nobody out on the top of the first. Ben Nemavant, the wide open stance, stands back in behind nothing and two. Darian Williams keeping an eye up from third base in the outfield left to right this afternoon. Austin Krizik, Ryland Charles, and Alex Pimentel, who was the DH yesterday, playing in right today. 
So Tino Panaro doing the dh this afternoon. Here's the slider that Sherman misses outside, trying to expand the strike zone, but a smart watch there by Nemovant for a called ball one. Nemovant in the loss yesterday, singled as mentioned in his first at bat, but then grounded out three times and popped out twice following. It was a well-worn path to the plate from both dugouts yesterday. A lot of different hitters got in, including a ton of pinch hitters from both sides. Two curveball hit in the air to shallow center field. Charles charging, diving. He's able to make the catch. Ryland Charles retires the first out here on the top of the first as Bobo retreats back to second. What a play from Ryland Charles. That right ankle that we had talked about yesterday and nursing it going into the day, but looks to be all good after yesterday and that grab. Yeah, he was playing in the right spot. They had a position relatively shallow, but still got a great break on the ball. And that's one of the toughest catches to make as an outfielder is coming straight in on a ball that you're trying to judge may not get, may not get all the way there we saw that last night in right field uh with a uh, ball that ended up being a triple for the tigers chaz myers the right-handed hitting shortstop takes a called strike one to begin his first plate appearance and that play yesterday with panaro looked like he caught it he was really close as it bounced just underneath his glove late in the game that allowed pacific to score and run in the seventh inning it was their penultimate run out of six a one pitch pops sky high right in the middle of the infield now tailing towards the right side is the second baseman Horvat calls off Kate Higgins and is able to make the catch while falling over in the infield grass sometimes those are as tough as the play as Charles made out in center field is that one sky high right into the blue blue sky not a cloud up there yeah the beauty of today is there is absolutely no wind our, our uh, old glory out in center field is hanging straight down but that those are hard to judge when they get up into this light blue sky Plus, you got as soon as the ball was up in the air, we had an airplane coming straight over the infield. You'll have that happen a lot here at Early Wilson, right near the newly named Harry Reid International Airport. Right handed hitting Jeremy Lee in there and takes a called ball one, maybe a little bit down and inside from Josh Sharman. Lee serving as a designated hitter today, walked twice, hit by a pitch, and doubled in the loss yesterday. The most experienced, if not the most experienced player on this Pacific roster. Watches as Charmin turns and looks back to second. Horvat playing near the bag, but no pickoff throw. Lee on that double yesterday in the sixth inning ripped it down the left field line. He never advanced past second base as two of the next three batters recorded putouts in order. He pops it up high and fouled on the first base side. Kate Higgins will watch it bounce just over the newly erected right field bull or dugout rather, or the bullpen for the Rebels, the new shade structure and the new blocking structure up here they've got the, the backstop behind where the catcher would see it's an, an obscured view here on the right field side the ball and a strike to lee spelled lea as he stands close to the plate the lefty Sharman delivers check swing on a fastball missing inside they'll appeal down the first baseline and big tim vesey down there signals safe that he was able to hold up on the check swing if you look at the alignment of the outfield today Based on what we saw last night, there wasn't a lot of balls hit by Pacific that were really barreled. They were kind of a slap team last night. So we've got a relatively short outfield right now. We were talking pregame. There was maybe one ball that went over an outfielder's head. So the cutter down by the feet, misses for a ball. Count goes three and one to Lee. Nice play by Charles late in the game. Everybody else had to come in and Austin Krizik really wasn't challenged much at all last night. Hard throwing Noah Beal induced a lot of Opposite field balls in play. His first outing of the year. Beal finishing with a no decision and a strong start. One pitch. Chop fouled on the third base side. And Arian Williams gave it a look, but watch this one roll into the corner. A bench bat for Pacific down to go grab it. Yeah, when you look at the lineup that uh, Tigers have uh, out there, with starting four freshmen in the field, you know, that a lot of new at bats against college for the first uh, time they're seeing uh, college D1 pitchers. They were late on a lot of them, but they put the ball in play. Yeah, Beal sitting anywhere from 91 to 94 last night. His velocity with a big uptick over the last couple of seasons. A swing and a high drive to left field, but playable for Austin Krizik as the left fielder shades his eyes with the glove and makes the catch just off the right shoulder. So a leadoff walk, steals second, but is stranded from there. As Josh Sharman's able to navigate his way out of a jam in the top of the first inning, the Hustlin' Rebels come to bat in the bottom of the first next.
represent the people, spread across the country. Bottom of the first here from early Wilson Stadium. No score between UNLV and Pacific. A similar lineup, the same one to nine for UNLV today. Leading off the left-handed batting center fielder, Ryland Charles. He'll be up against the freshman right-hander, Jacob Smith, the Southern Florida product, making his collegiate debut. The Delray Beach native up against the Reno, Nevada native. A couple of differing climates as Ryland Charles slaps the first pitch straight back. And we're underway after the foul ball gets us going in the bottom of the first. So far, so good for Josh Sharman in the top of the first inning. Walked the leadoff batter in a long A.B., but then got three weakly popped up balls for the three outs in a row. Ryland Charles, the only Rebel yesterday without a hit, finished 0 for 5. He did reach and score when he was hit by a pitch. Takes that one off the outside to even the count at 1 and 1. And Charles, even in a game where statistically didn't really do much, he always finds ways to make an impact. Right-hander deals. Charles puts it on the ground. A ripped ball up the middle is through for a base hit. So on command, Ryland Charles with his first base hit of the 2023 campaign. And it will not be his last. He led the team in that category a year ago. Yeah, this, this morning taking BP, Coach Higgins uh, commented to Ryland, um, that, that's going to get you on the board. And Charles came back and said, well, my name's on the board. There's just no numbers attached to it. You always want to have those, especially for a guy that led the team in hits and the team that led the country in hits. He means he did something right last year and gets on the board with base hit number one. Here's Santino Panaro, who bumped up in the lineup mightily after last year. Going to hit number two for the majority of this season. Facing the right-hander Smith out of the stretch. His first pitch is chunked down and outside for a ball. Jacob Weiss doing the catching this afternoon. He was at first base yesterday. Hitting Casa Grande taking over at first today. He came in out of the bullpen last night. Peyton Miller at second. Chaz Myers at short and Rylan Evans at third. Same as the 16-4 final yesterday. In the outfield left to right, Ben Nemavant, John Howard Bobo, and Tony Otis. Morrow leans out of the way of this cutting fastball riding in on him. Upper 80s, low 90s for Jacob Smith, the hard thrower making his collegiate debut today, falling behind Panaro 2-0. The beauty of Panaro in that second spot, he really he really protects Charles there batting leadoff. With Charles getting on base, Panaro has the game to move him over. He may not be that power guy, but he's gonna he's gonna advance runners day in and day out. A lot of that just comes down to putting balls in play. It's, his bat to ball skills are just so advanced for a, a young player, a true sophomore out of Bishop Gorman High School. One of the hardest outs in college baseball last year. Really tough guy to strike out as well. Last year, just 12 strikeouts in 159 at bats. He puts bat on ball way more often than not. Takes ball four off the outside here. So a leadoff base hit followed by a four pitch walk. And the Rebels in business already with two on and nobody out. And the power swinging catcher Jacob Sharp do it. He was three for four with a pair of RBIs and a triple in his debut a night ago. That was a heck of a coming out night for Sharpie. Called a good game behind the plate. Made some really good stops, but at the plate, he, you know, you don't look like it. You got a 5'9", 175 pound catcher. Hits with power. Yeah, sharp four home runs and a 313 batting average in just 36 games last year at Fullerton College. A two year Juco player now at the D1 level. Just takes that pitch high from Sharp. They were called ball one. Jacob Smith on the hill, 2-1 record with a 3-2-3 ERA last year in his senior season of high school at Terravella High School near Miami. He was a highly recruited player, but he committed to Pacific before his senior year. This is outside with the slider. They get that six straight balls that he's fired in there. Venture to guess Sharp might be taking a strike here. I think you're going to see a lot of selection today at the plate with that freshman. You know, that's tough to come in as a true freshman to face one of the hardest hitting, best hitting college baseball teams in America. 
Smith working out of the stretch, brings the glove set at the belt, takes a look at second, now deals. Pitch outside, three balls and no strikes, and that red light may have just gotten even more red for Jacob Smith and Jacob Sharp, the battle here in the bottom of the first inning. It's Charles off second and Santino Panaro off first. Yeah, a young pitcher like Smith coming in, he looks a little out of balance right now. Maybe he's trying to overthrow a little bit. He's got to settle down, let the game come to him a little bit more. That chest high heater is in for a called strike. The first since the first batter. That was Charles, who's now on second base. And in a 3 1 count, sharp wide open to do whatever he wants. It's got to be right there for him to swing, but with the Darian Williams looming on deck, just any way to get on base will do the job for sharp. Second baseman Fuller keeping an eye on Charles. No hold on Panaro off first. 3-1, foul back off the hand. Sharp saw that fastball up and in. You can see the eyes light up even from behind. Yeah, he was uh, waiting on that fastball. He knows the, the young guy's got to come in with uh, full count now. He's going to be looking something in the zone, and uh, Smith is not going to want to uh, load the bases here with a walk. The Whittier, California native Jacob Sharp stares down Smith, who comes set on 3-2. and two. And the pitch. Call for strike three. That fastball found the outside of the plate. Sharp was already halfway down to first when he was rung up for out number one. Good pitch by Smith. Came with the, the heater. Although Sharp was probably looking for that. Thought it was outside uh, away from him. But caught the edge of the plate. And that's the first strikeout for the young man in his college career. Yeah, that's a definite confidence pitch right there for Smith. That's a good one to see go over for any pitcher, let alone somebody in their collegiate debut. Here's a guy who's five years removed from his collegiate debut, be Darian Williams, the most experienced player here on this UNLV roster. Moved into the cleanup spot and playing third base this year. Look out, ducks away from a first pitch curveball up by the brim of the helmet for ball one. Yeah, again, right there you saw where Smith had a good, a good uh, pitch sequence against Sharp. Came in a little bit hot right there, a little off balance. He's gonna need to settle down against a good hitter like the Darian. One for four in the win yesterday. Pinch hit for late. It was a parade of pinch hitters in the last two innings for both teams. Darian fouls a fastball straight back, held within the netting as the count goes one ball and one strike against the Rancho High School product. The count evened up right here. Uh, Darian's going to be looking for breaking ball, probably away. Pretty big gap between center and right. Darren's going to be looking for something to drive here. Yeah, Bobo shaded way towards left field. It was a very similar pitch there to the one that was called for strike three on Sharp, but this time ruled as ball two to Darian Williams, a career 329 hitter. Coming into this, his fifth collegiate season. And 670 collegiate at bats. That is by far the most on the roster. And not too far behind him, though. Guy on deck, Austin Krizik. Smith picks the leg, looks towards second, but no throw, nobody guarding. Really only the second baseman, Miller, keeping an eye on Ryland Charles off first. The first baseman, Casagrande, way off the line, allowing Santino Pinaro to get a pretty big lead with one out. Here in the bottom of inning number one, still scoreless in game two of 55 for UNLV. Williams drives this one the other way, but later on on that pitch, it's fouling out of plate on the right field line. Count goes even at two, and Williams, his swing has definitely gotten a little bigger, a little bit more power driven over the last couple of years, but he's always been able to shorten it up with two strikes. Yeah, he's been a good two strike hitter throughout his career, and I think uh, he's actually gonna get better. It'll be interesting here with two and two count, one down, what Coach Higgins does on the base path. Let's see if the runners go in motion. And Smith comes set looking at second, Miller backs away at second base. Runner stay as Williams takes outside. So now with that thought on two and two, I think it's even more imperative here on three and two. And wouldn't be surprised to see the runners in motion. No, not with a good contact hitter like Darian. Especially with Austin Krizik on deck, you'd love to have at least multiple players in scoring position and on base. Biggest pitch of the game so far here in the bottom of the first. On three and two. Charles breaks from second. Williams puts it in play on the ground to short. A two-hop chopper picked up by Chaz Myers. A high throw. Gloved at first by Casagrande. So Charles was the only one that broke initially. 
but Naro followed up behind him, and that's why you get him in motion right there. That got him out of the double play for sure. Yeah, that's perfect uh, coaching right there from Coach Higgins at third base. That is a double play ball if the runners aren't breaking. And again, it was not an immediate break from Santino Panaro, but was moving once the attention had been turned towards Charles going from second to third. So even though Williams grounded out, he did the job, hitting it slow enough and high enough on the bounce to negate a double play ball. And now with two outs, a couple of runners in scoring position, here's Austin Krizik. Another high fastball turning him away. That's back-to-back -back batters that have had to lean out of the way, high and inside from the right. Krizik like two for four in the opening game of the season last night with a two-run home run in the second, scored Jacob Sharp from second base. And a cross up there from Smith. The catcher Weiss will go out and have a word. But for Austin Krizik, 342 average last year. He's got a 348 average over his collegiate career. Never been one to struggle at the plate. He just has always found ways to consistently put the ball in play and drive it into open gaps. Now, Austin's been a primarily a pull hitter throughout his career, but he will go opposite field. And if you look at the alignment from the right fielder, he is shaded way over towards center field. So look for something on the outside part of the plate for Austin to take that way. Center fielder Bobo a couple of steps towards left. Rizik started to go around, was able to hold it up. That pitch down by the back hip. And able to hold up on that. Count goes two balls, no strikes to Krizik. And this is a batter that Smith wants with the hot hitting Kate Higgins batting from the left side of the plate. He doesn't want to see him with the bases loaded. Former Centennial Bulldog heading to the count. Two balls and no strikes. Leans away from another curveball. Smith has been starting all those breaking pitches up by the shoulder of the right-handed batters. And a, a ton of movement downward. Going more right to left. Fastball, curveball, changeup. The three-pitch arsenal for the tall right-hander Jacob Smith. He liked the frame. The control has left a little bit to be desired, at least here early on. He's behind three balls, no strikes. Krizik taking all the way, watches that chest-high fastball for strike one. Co coaching on showcase early. The 3-1 counts, the 3-0 counts. A lot of patience, at least to start here today. Yeah, and you're going to see that here, too. Chris is going to be really choosy at the, with this pitch right now. If he doesn't like it, he's going to lay off, do, off of it and not, not going to be afraid to have a full count. So when Sharp got to 3-1, and one, Smith went inside on the fastball. See what he does here to the power batting Austin Krizik. He goes high with the fastball, missing way upstairs. A great leaping grab by the catcher, Jacob Weiss, to keep that one from going to the backstop. Keeps the runners at bay as a new one is added to first. Krizik on first base, Panaro in scoring position on second, and Ryland Charles, who led the inning off with a base hit, stands on third. Sacks full, two down for a guy who had an outstanding debut among a bunch of outstanding debuts yesterday. It's coach's kid, Kate Higgins. Yeah, what a coming out night for Kate. You know, coming into a new ballpark like this, that was a big stage for him, and he really was able to star last night. Four for five with a home run and three more runs scored. Kate Higgins did a lot of the heavy lifting himself offensively. Left-handed batter. Smartly watches that first pitch fastball. A, a beautiful pitch to swing at, but with the way that Smith has been dealing today, it likely been instructed to take a strike. Absolutely. It looked like that was take all the way. Now he's going to be looking for something inside. He drove that ball uh, over the right field fall wall last night with an inside pitch. Almost fisted it over. But that ball left the ballpark quick, 106 uh, velo exit uh, velocity. So, you know, he's a power hitter, but he's also going to be a guy that just takes what he's given. Yeah, Higgins, a big, powerful left-handed bat. Listed at 6'2", 210 pounds. The Spring Valley High School graduate. Transferred after two years at Arizona State. Here's the 1-1 pitch to him as Smith comes set and deals. Another fastball watch just on the outer third for a called strike. Higgins... Yeah, didn't agree with the call. You could tell right away is it's a called strike two to move in one and two. That's about as much emotion as you're ever going to see from Kate. Which in a, in a lot of ways is a, is a good thing. You don't you don't want to have too many highs, too many lows as a as a player, especially a guy who's just trying to earn right. his stripes here. Yep. One two offering, breaking pitch in there for strike three. Smith gets out of a bases loaded jam in the bottom of inning number one. We're on to the second. No score between UNLV and Pacific. You're watching Hustlin' Rebels Baseball.
runs on one hit. No errors and three left on base. With the Contour Sports app from Cox, you can watch a game live and track multiple games at once. It's all right there on your TV. The Sports app is part of the new Contour from Cox. Hurry to a Cox Solutions store or visit Cox.com backslash Contour to learn more. Top of the second, no score between UNLV and Pacific, along with Dan Dolby. Matt Never bringing you the action on a picture-perfect Saturday from Las Vegas. Josh Sharman back out after allowing a leadoff walk and then getting three outs in quick succession in the top of the first inning. Top of inning number two will begin with the freshman second baseman, Peyton Miller, for Pacific. And Sharman efficient. Three team pitches to four batters in that first inning. Good butt down the third base side, barehanded by Adarian Williams. That throw way inside the bag. Good job by Kate Higgins to come off of it and make the grab. So Miller safe at first on a bunt single, but Higgins prevents it from being more. Yeah, that was a great job by Darian barehanding that ball. With a big body like that, he's going to have to get his feet underneath him to make an accurate throw to first. And Williams played four years of second base before moving over to the hot quarter this year. So still kind of learning the nuance of the position. He did a good job yesterday, and that one just kind of what you get from a new third baseman shaded deep. I think Miller caught everybody by surprise with the bunt. Gonna snap a throw down to first, back in head first and safely is Miller. It's Jacob Weiss doing the catching today, batting with an open stance from the right side now with one out, or rather no outs, and a runner on first. Another throw over to first base, and this one gets past Higgins. Into the corner it goes, rounding second, turning towards third is Miller. He's going to be in standing up, and the stop sign held up as Santino Panaro's throw goes to Kate Higgins. So that's for Josh Sharman, the disadvantage of that pickoff move. He looked like he was thinking as the pitch was going in. Absolutely. That was actually one of his slower moves to first base. Kind of double-clutched it a little bit, threw it low in the dirt. Higgins couldn't come up with it, so we got an E on the pitcher, Sharman. The Rebels committed two defensive miscues yesterday. Pacific with three. You'll see that a lot in early season games. Not quite as sharp on the defensive end. As this one swung on, hit in the air to left. Playable for Krizik. Runner tagging up from third. Kriz makes the grab. He'll unload on a throw to the plate. Edarian Williams cuts it off. The runner was going to be safe on a sacrifice fly. Jacob Weiss gives Pacific a one to nothing lead in the second. Yeah, good piece of hitting right there. Getting the advancement to third off the air by Sharman off the pickoff move, put them in a good position right there. Just get a sacrifice, kind of a lazy fly ball to mid center, or excuse me, left field. Uh, strong throw, but uh, good break by the runner on third and easily scores. Just a little too deep for Krizik. Off the bat, you knew it was going to be tough. So with the bases empty and now one out, the first pitch way up and out to Rylan Evans. Sharman, after allowing a bunt base hit, it's two base error. It made the difference, all the difference in that one. It's something that you will not see nearly as much as A, a butt base hit, and B, pitchers picking off as much. This one's lined out to left field. Krizik can't get there as it bounces in front of the left field. A good job to cut it off and prevent extra bases, but Evans, with his first hit of the day, reaches first base after going four for five yesterday. Finished a homer shy of the cycle. That breaking ball just hung up in the zone a little bit. Got a good uh, whip on it. With uh, Krizik playing shaded more towards center field, it was an easy single, but strong throw into second, making sure that, uh, to your point, runner stays on first, setting up the double play. Krizik, very good defensively when it comes to shading deep, shading shallow, and just the angles that are necessary. As a bunt attempt is missed, throw down to first, just not in time. It's the right fielder, Tony Otis, that 
offered up at that pitch high and outside for a strike. And a great throw by Sharp. Higgins nearly slapped the tag on Evans at first. Yeah, good job by Sharpie. That was a, a nice throw just to the foul side of the bag. Good swipe tag, just missing. Sharman to the plate, pulls the string on a changeup and gets a swing and a miss from Otis, who's quickly behind nothing in two. You look at the velocities from Sharman in the first inning. The fastball sitting 83 to 84. He threw all five pitches out of the 18 that he threw in the first. The cutter sitting about 80 miles an hour. He threw that once or twice. He's got the runner in motion, and he's out. Great pickoff move, and that's more of what Charmin's going to want. Correct. He had no hesitation on that pickoff move right there. And he is borderline Bach on every one of those throws over to first base. But that that throw right there is what we're used to seeing from Charmin. And he gets a swing and a miss on the very next pitch. Otis down on strikes. Charmin limits the damage to a run on a sacrifice fly. And UNLV, for the first time in two games, bats from behind in the bottom of the second inning next. UNLV Baseball brought to you by Finley Chevrolet, located in the southwest at 215 in South Rainbow. They're Nevada's number one Chevrolet volume dealership. Finley Chevrolet, frankly, we're customer driven. We're here in the bottom of inning number two with the Rebels trailing the Pacific Tigers one to nothing. Seven, eight, and nine due up for the home side up against the right-hander Jacob Smith. It's Alex Pimentel, the right fielder, Paul Myro, the shortstop, and Gianni Horvat, the second baseman. First three Rebels to get it going against Smith. Pimentel squares to bunt, pulls it back on a pitch that misses inside for ball one. Pimentel one of two with a couple of walks and was hit by a pitch in his debut yesterday while playing as a designated hitter, making his first start defensively today playing in right field. And the coaching staff loves the way that he roams the range of the outfield. He takes a called strike to even the count. Yeah, big body guy like that has really fluid movement, so they're looking for him to be really defensive out there in the right field slot. They're playing him to pull, the right-handed hitter with a a couple of steps either way to the outfield. Turns into this one and is hit. Got him in the back right arm, the inside of that right elbow. As he does have the left elbow protected, but you don't see it often on that right side. He turned into that one, held back on the swing. No argumentation from Chris Rodriguez and the Pacific coaching staff. So Pimentel on base for the fourth time in two games. Second time via being hit by a pitch. Not necessarily what you want, but you'll take it if you're Pimentel as Myro digs in. Yeah, he went to check his swing right there, still almost committed to get the hands through the plate, but was able to hold up, and they call it no swing. So we're going to get a free pass with a hit by pitch. So Jacob Smith hits his first batter, brings up Myro from the right. Shortstop takes high on the fastball for ball one. Myro yesterday, two for four. He clubbed a home run as well that left the field in a hurry towards left center. He drove in four of the Rebels' 16 runs. He had an outstanding debut as well. Really, all the new guys were did the heavy lifting offensively. They were the best offensive players yesterday. Yeah, those those three to seven slots, they really came through. 
This one goes off the glove of the catcher into the backstop. That one likely a pass ball, advancing the runner from first to second base. So now Pimentel, the tying run in scoring position for Myro, who did nothing but drive in runs yesterday. Yeah, and with a 2-0 count here, they're probably going to be pretty careful with him after the uh, his show last night with first base open take their chances with uh, Horvat uh, coming up off of uh, the on-deck circle. It's not your typical bottom third of the lineup that you see in college baseball where you just kind of bury your best fielders who need to hit somewhere. As Myro takes high in a 3 nothing count, likely going to have a stop sign here. Yeah, if you're looking over at uh, Coach Higgins, he's squaring up with... He's squaring up to the field to see where the alignment is right here, but you're almost positive he's going to get the stop sign. Right fielder way off the line as Otis playing in right center. Myro with the stop sign watches that heater right down Broadway for a called strike one. But you like the coachability early in the season. There's a definite plan when these guys get into the box, which isn't always the case at this level. Uh, absolutely. You're going to see that change throughout the season. He may have the green light on 3-0 and on a kid that's going to come with it at him with a fastball. Fastball on 3-1. It's poked in the air right behind second base. The shortstop Myers cuts in front of the second baseman Miller to make the catch for the out. Man, off the bat, thought that that one was going to be a surefire dropper into shallow center field. Great base running by Pimentel to re recognize the backspin right away. Yeah, Pim saw that pretty much off the bat. We almost had a pretty good collision there at second with uh, Shorten and the second baseman right there. But good job by Pimentel to be able to hold. He was in no hurry to get over with, with no outs and nobody in front of him. Because even if he holds up, that ball drops, he's going to score regardless with his speed. As mentioned, here's Johnny Horvat bringing up the number nine spot in the lineup. G takes the first pitch high, as have many of the Rebels the first time through. And I think with the lack of control from Smith so far, and the man behind him warming up now in the bullpen down the left field side, we may see even more of that. Make him come to you with at least one strike per at bat. Yeah, he's overthrowing that fastball, especially first pitch to each batter. 1-0 to Horvat, nicely spotted, down and inside for a called strike, one to even the count. Gianni, yesterday, one of four, he was also hit by a pitch and stole the first base of his college career. We we'll expect to see some more aggressive base running across the board, but with a fully healthy Gianni Horvat this year, I think he's going to try to take some extra bases more often than not, for sure. It's high here, two balls and a strike to the second baseman. If you watch the mechanics of Smith on the mound right now, young guy still really trying to develop to be a collegiate pitcher. When he's high on that, you, you're looking at his, his back angles. He's really kind of stiff at this point. So he's getting a lot of release high. Horvat hits this one high. It's in shallow right field. Going back is Miller. Right fielder Otis calls him off. He was able to settle underneath it and make the catch on a ball that had a ton of side spin. That one was flying towards the corner. Credit to Miller for getting close. Credit to Otis for calling him off and making the catch for out number two. As Pimentel retreats to second base with two outs. Here's Ryland Charles, and as the lineup wraps back around to the top, Charles with the only base hit for UNLV so far after he was the only Rebel without a hit yesterday in the starting lineup. Much better pitch by Smith right there. Good, good back angle, good arm angle, kept the ball down, and uh, was able to produce the pop-up from Horvat. A lot of times guys at this level, especially young players, the true freshman Smith in his debut, it's just about repeatability, finding what works and doing it over and over again. Well, you're going to hear from co pitching coaches, it's all about consistency and sustainability, right? You've got to keep that arm in the same slot. Everything's got to look the same coming out of the hand. And it, it is tougher for the high effort delivery guys like Smith. You'll see dudes casually flipping 92 in there on fastballs without looking like they're trying. Meanwhile, you got Smith who definitely gives it his all every pitch. Nothing wrong with either, but it's just the difference of delivery. And he'll develop that as he goes on in his career and gets more uh, more experience on the mound. Uh, Right-hander warming up in the Pacific bullpen, number 44, Quinlan Sweeney. So Smith may not be long for his college debut. He's here pitching in his second inning of work. He's behind the leadoff man, Charles, 2-0, with a runner on second and two down. Shortstop Myers keeping an eye on him. Everybody else... A step towards the right field side all the way around. Charles watching all the way. That one close, but called for ball three. So again, another 3-0 count with Santino Panaro waiting on deck. Would be very surprised, to say the least, if we see Ryland Charles offer up at anything. Yeah, and that's a beauty, too. We talked about last inning with uh, with uh, Panaro hitting behind Charles. This year. You go lefty-lefty. So they're in a good spot right now. He can be choosy. Here's the 3-0. 
Over the outer third for a called strike. Charles never picked the bat up. He was taking all the weight. So two walks and a hit by pitch so far for Smith. And he's tiptoeing the line against the leadoff batter, Charles, here. Catcher Weiss hangs down a sign. Smith takes it and comes set. Look to second. And now the 3-1 to the plate. Charles watches that one at the letters. He maybe thought that that one was ball four. That's typically the pitch that he loves, those high fastballs. He can get the arms extended, but I think that's smart here. Make, make Smith throw some extra pitches. Yeah, but a great pitch by Smith. He's had flashes of really good control and some good movement so far. So we've been talking about, though, it's been the consistency, at least in a very, very small sample size early. Charles hits it in the air to left center field over his Bobo. Center fielder on the move, makes a grab at the chest. He covered plenty of ground to take away a base hit and then some from Ryland Charles. So no runs, no hits, one man left on. And through two innings full, it's Pacific 1, UNLV nothing. At the bottom of the second, no runs, no hits, no errors, and one left on base. Josh Sharman back out for a third inning of work, pitching from behind as Pacific was able to play to run on a sacrifice fly in the top of the second inning. We're in the top of the third here in game two out of three between the Hustlin' Rebels and the Tigers. Nine, one, and two due up for the visiting side. Aiden Casagran, the right-handed batting first baseman to lead things off. His first plate appearance begins with a line drive, roped foul on the third base side. Missed it by a couple of inches. That's been a hot spot for Pacific. When they have put a charge into pitches over the last two days, that's been where they hit it hard is those line drives on the third base side. And we saw one down the first base line last night also by a left-handed hitter. You know, right now what Sharman needs to do is he needs to establish a little consistency himself. We talked about that with Smith. He's had base runners on each inning. This is a chance for him to kind of buckle down and say this is this is where I, I can take control. The one thing that Pacific did do especially well offensively last night was make the pitchers work. It was Noah Beal through four plus. Rupp went four full, and then Cole Roberts slammed the door in the ninth, but none of them retired an inning in a one-two-three fashion. No. Charmin misses low here to bring the count two balls and a strike. They, they did not go down without a fight in any inning where the Rebels towards the end of the game started to once they got the big lead. Yeah, I think it, with all the freshmen, all the youngsters they got in this team, I would be pretty happy with the way that my team played last night if I'm Coach Rodriguez. Line drive up the middle, picked up on the second hop by Myro. Slick fielding shortstop, slings one to first base for a 6-3 ground out on the scorecard at home. And for Paul Myro, that's what we're going to see all year. Beautiful fielding, he makes it look easy. Yeah, he goes really well to his left. He, uh, he was shading that way just a little bit, but had to make cover about you know, 12 to 15 feet right there. But we're going to see that consistency from Paul all year. That's your prototypical play for the shortstop. That's the one that you want them to make in their sleep. This one's hit to the third base side, gloved by Adarian Williams, and a picture-perfect throw for the second out. Retires the leadoff man, John Howard Bobo. So as we're talking about Charmin struggling to get outs in succession, he gets two quick outs on a couple of ground balls to the left side. But now the challenge is to retire Ben Nemovan. 
lined out to center field, took a great grab by Charles in the first. And this is the consistency that the coaching staff is talking about with Sharp, right? He does a really good job sometimes, and then gets a little lackadaisical. But right there, he comes back with a nice little cutter, fouled off. Good pitch right there. Yeah, you like to see him coming back and being aggressive on the first pitch to the next batter, even with the first two going down quickly, one, two. Emma Vanth, the only left-handed batter in the lineup, both yesterday and today. As the lefty Sharman takes a curveball over the inner third for a called strike. And there's the bulldog mentality that we've wanted to see Sharman develop over the last couple seasons. And you just saw it right there. He slapped his glove on his thigh and said, let's go. He's ready to go. He's working with some tempo as well out of the stretch. As Nemavant thought about it, able to hold up as the curveball bounces in. That's a good 0-2 miss. We saw that from Beal yesterday with nothing Great to a couple times. Pitch. Great 0-2 pitch right there. And they're looking for to get uh, the batter to chase. One two curveball right down the middle. Call for strike three. Josh Sharman dominant in the third. The bats will look to back him up. Pacific leads UNLV one to nothing. This is UNLV baseball. Parkway Tavern, official partner of UNLV Athletics and your official home of Rebels on the Road. With over 250 beers, 24-7 gaming, and five Valley locations, there's no better place to catch the game than Parkway Tavern. Let's go Rebels. Rebels coming up to bat in the home half of the third, trailing Pacific one to nothing. They'll make their third trip to the plate against the new arm. It's the right-hander, uh, the lone senior on the pitching staff, Quindlin Sweeney, wearing number 44, the six foot three right-hander out of Northern California will be up against the two, three, four spots in the Rebel lineup. Sweeney coming in behind Jacob Smith, who made his collegiate debut today. Two innings, didn't give up a run on two hits, two walks and a hit batsman. He struck out two in his college debut, and Sweeney starts the rotation of the bullpen, which I'm sure he will not be the first or the last guy out of the pen we see today. And as we say that, there's a couple of arms and bodies warming up. Really interesting with Sweeney. Listed as a senior, but has not appeared in a game yet for the Tigers. Did not appear in a game as a junior or a sophomore in his freshman year, redshirted due to injury. And he's a big body at 6'3", 210. See what he does here against the left-handed batting Santino Panaro. Leading things off for UNLV in the third. Panaro walked against Smith in the first. First pitch swinging, lines it into center field. Bobo watches it bounce in front of him. As the former CSN Coyote cuts it off, and Panaro, former Bishop Gorman, Gale reaches for the second time today. Now one of one with a base hit and a base on balls. Puts the tying run on for Jacob Sharp with the heart of the lineup due up. That's exactly what they need out of Panaro. Yeah, and with no line or, or book on Sweeney, right now they're just going to kind of have to freestyle up there because they don't have any history on it. And almost a different approach than what they did against Smith, especially once the lineup got through to the second time. They were ultra conservative. They took at least a pitch, at least a strike in every at-bat, it seems. And now with Pinaro swinging at the first pitch, see how aggressive Sharp is with the runner on. Holding on at first is Casagran. Good lead for Pinaro. As that pitch goes outside and squirts through to the backstop. So that wild pitch will advance Pinaro up to second base. And the job made that much easier for Sharp now with a runner in scoring position. 
Yeah, and again, Sweeney coming in hasn't had any appearances for the Tigers, so he's probably got his heart pumping a little bit. His blood pressure is probably a little high, and we're going to get a, a mound visit right now from pitching coach Elliot Cribby. Probably going to just talk to him about, hey, settle down, son. You're okay. This is your first time up on the mound. Let's uh, let's get you uh, dialed in here. And there is double barrel action going on down the left field side with not one but two right-handers getting loose for Pacific. So. As you mentioned for Sweeney, he not appeared in a game. He redshirted and then didn't pitch each of the last two seasons, but at least just judging on the roster, his high school numbers were gaudy. He was a four-year starter and was all state, all section, all state in California. He stole 46 bases as senior high school as well, so the guy can move. I haven't seen him throw too much, at least in his collegiate career. It's always interesting seeing and preparing for these games at certain schools you know you got your blue bloods your michigans your arkansas anywhere in the sec they were the media relations is you know major league level and then you got to do your own digging for some of these schools that are in the smaller conferences especially in the wcc yeah it's uh it, it's pretty interesting to watch the dynamics of these some of these small schools right sometimes you're going to find a hidden gem down there sometimes you, you, you take a, a kid like Smith that came out of Florida who committed before his senior year from a small school. So it, it's just an interesting, and some of the good coaches are going to find these gems that are hidden. Pacific, a very young team this year, as the first pitch bounces in after the mound visit. Sharp ahead, two balls and no strikes. This is a Pacific team that had three players drafted last year. A lot of the reason this year's team is so young with 18 newcomers and four freshmen in the starting lineup is just because of who they lost last year. You'll find that. If you look every couple of years, college baseball, pretty cyclical. Really only the top blue blood programs that can recruit year in and year out are consistently at the same level every year. Well, you're going to see a school like University of Pacific. You look at Cal State Bakersfield, some of these smaller schools over in California, they have an abundance of athletes over there, so they can find these guys. This pitch hits sharp in the back, so the control going from bad to worse for Sweeney, and that puts the go-ahead run on in the swift running catcher, Jacob Sharp. Good speed on second with Panaro as well. Going to speed on the pass for Edarian Williams. We'll see if they're going to leave Sweeney in, just see how short the leash is. There's now a right-hander and a left-hander warming up for Pacific. So they may even just try to go back to back. Yeah, I think it was a good mound visit by the pitching coach, Kribbe, but the message obviously didn't get through. Um, he's just got to settle down right now, try to throw something into the zone. If they hit it, they hit it. Williams grounded out to short back in the first. Hits one in the air that direction again. It goes underneath the glove of Myers for a base hit. Rounding third, coming around to the plate is Santino Panaro. And Darian Williams just did the job there, putting a ball in play. It snuck underneath the glove of Myers, who never touched it. That RBI single will put the Rebels on the board and tie this one up. That th thing took such a, a high second bounce. I'm not sure he would have had to play anywhere on the diamond. That's uh, one of the reasons why Darian is going to be given credit for the RBI, his first of the year after he drove in 67 a year ago, second on the team behind Hank Zeisler. With runners on first and second, still nobody out on the third. Here's Austin Krizik taking all the way in a first pitch curveball tumbling way outside. It's Williams on first and Sharp on second, and this is the kind of inning where the Rebels have been able to take advantage against teams like Pacific, and specifically against Pacific over the last couple of years. Yeah, and this is a situation right now. Krizik is just salivating. He gets the hands underneath this one, lifts it deep to right field. Back into the corner is Otis. Still on the move. He's able to make the catch in front of the warning track. Both runners tag up. Beautiful relay to second base, and Williams is out. Great job by the second baseman. Miller on the transfer. Score that one 9-4-6 on the put out at second base. Advancing to third is Sharp. So Krizik did the job, but it was just an even better relay from right field to second base to the shortstop covering the bag. Yeah, I'd be interested to see what the communication was from first base coaching box, uh, Coach Jones, on sending or not sending Darian at that point. It may have been him going on his own. Kate Higgins in from the left side. Takes that breaking ball away. On a play like that, you like the advancement from Sharp. I thought it was aggressive by Williams, and the coaching staff told us that that's more of what we're going to see top to bottom in the lineup, but it had to be the perfect relay, and it was. I think that is more so of, of what just happened, because Williams can run as well. Yeah, early in the game, you're going to see a little aggressiveness like that. Hey, if they're behind, you're probably not going to see that aggressiveness on the base pass. Very true. Yeah, game situation dictates a lot of those decisions. It's Higgins takes that slider just off the outside. He's ahead two balls, no strikes, as he was in his first plate appearance. 
where he struck out looking on a beautiful pitch by Smith. Quoted both of his strikeouts in that first frame. 2-0 fastball just below the kneecaps as Isaac has moved ahead, or rather Higgins has moved ahead, three balls and no strikes. So as aggressive as they were against Smith, or rather how conservative they were against Smith, they've been ultra aggressive against Sweeney. And I think with the lack of control would be, again, surprised to see Higgins go around here. He holds up, smartly so, as he takes a called ball forward. It's the second walk of the inning issued by Quinlan Sweeney. That puts runners on the corners with two outs for Alex Pimentel, who works his way around to the right-hand side. This is a situation where you may see the Rebels get a little aggressive, sending, even with two outs, sending Higgins to see what the play is going to be on in the infield from a defensive standpoint. And just taking a glance down towards the Pacific bullpen, they had two different arms warming up. Now they have zero. Everybody's sat down, and everybody's returned to the dugout. First pitch bounces, gets to the backstop. Sharp is going to score from third, and the Rebels lead 2-1 to one as Higgins moves up to second as well on that wild pitch from Sweeney. Yeah, uh, right there, Sweeney just overthrowing at this point. Blood's pumping, adrenaline's really high. He All he's got to do is put ball in play right there with two outs, try to get a, a ground ball, but overthrowing the pitch and, uh, and the Rebels make him pay for it. And almost on command, there's now a left-hander up and tossing again. So a lot of moving parts in that Pacific bullpen. That one's in for a strike just on the outside of Pimentel. The count's even at one with two outs, and the Rebels now on top two to one here in the third. Yeah, great breaking ball right there by Sweeney. He didn't overthrow it. He just uh, let his arm do the motion and uh, was able to catch the outside part of the plate. Breaking pitch, crushed into left center field. Back goes the left fielder, Nemovet. He's at the track, he can't make the grab. A diving effort falls short as one run scores. Here comes Pimentel rounding second. He's in standing up at third with an RBI triple. And Nemovet just now getting up. That was a full extension, full effort. And he was unable to grab it. Pimentel triples, and the Rebel lead now 3-1. to one. Yeah, that ball was driven by Pimentel to the 375 mark, just uh, short hop the outfield wall right there. Nemovet gave it a heck of an effort. Looked like he was gonna stay down for a little bit. Might've got the wind knocked out of him, but a great piece of hitting right there from Pim. Just missed a home run by a couple of feet. That's as hard as we've seen him hit one in a game in a very small sample size, if you include the inner squad scrimmages. Well, I think he was tired of getting hit by a pitch. <laughs> He's had a couple over the last two days as Paul Myro stands in from the right, takes a ball high. Myro popped out to the shortstop. Myers up the middle in the second. But a great job by Pimentel of kind of showing what he's got. He's more known as a defender and really can run. You knew he was going to get at least three there. I was surprised he didn't make a bigger turn around third. Thought he might have had a chance. He might have been tired. That's the thing, too. you got to get the oxygen tank out this early in the season. As Myro takes a called strike, one on a breaking ball. Myro showed some pop yesterday. That was actually where Pimentel's ball was. That was exactly where Myro's cleared the fence. I knew he had a little bit of pop, but he showed it off in spades a night ago. Takes that pitch just off the outside for ball two. He's taking a look at the outfield alignment. Bobo straight up in center field. Extremely deep and right is Otis. He's seen something in the scouting report that indicates that they should have the right fielder extremely deep. With the runner on third and two outs. The infield straight up. As Mayo takes that front door slider. Sweeney's able to spin it in for a called strike two. Deuces wild here in the third. Two balls, two strikes, two outs, a two-run lead for UNLV. This is where Sweeney just needs to settle down a little bit, throw something low in the zone, try to get out of this inning. Here's the 2-2 out of the stretch. It sneaks past the catcher. A late break from Pimentel, but he's able to score standing up. That's the third wild pitch of the inning, and that's a big one with the pass ball allowing another run, and the Rebels have now jumped on top 4-1. to one. This is the kind of inning that we were expecting once they started putting runners on early. Correct, and the numbers are going to come big uh, each inning that the Rebels get some guys on, on base. But right there, again, we talked about Sweeney just kind of settling down, keep that ball low. He just tried to overthrow. Now three wild pitches in one inning. Catcher Weiss going over to grab a new mitt. When we typically see that, there's some piece of webbing that had popped off, and he's just going to get a, a backup piece of leather to finish up the inning and then do some maintenance in the dugout. He's, they, he's had to work this inning. Oh, yeah, that's saying the least. He's also scheduled about fourth in the top of the fourth. But the count full with nobody on and two outs here at a four-run third at this point. Here's the offering. 
Breaking pitch, grounded to the left side, charging is the third baseman Evans, who gloves, sets, and fires to first in time, limiting the damage. UNLV on the board for the first time in a major way. Four runs on three hits, no errors, and nobody left on. We've played three innings full. The Rebels on top for the first time by a four to one score. UNLV Baseball brought to you by Intermountain Healthcare. Here to be a part of your Las Vegas life and more importantly, here to help you live an even healthier one. Intermountain Healthcare, official partner of UNLV Athletics. Josh Sharman pitching with a lead for the first time as we begin the top of the fourth inning. The bats breaking out in the bottom of the third, sorting three or four runs rather on three hits, including an RBI triple from Alex Pimentel out in right field. And Josh Sharman, coincidentally enough, sparked all that with a one, two, three top of the inning as he's really starting to settle in. He'll face off against numbers three, four, and five in the Pacific lineup. First pitch to Chaz Myers, the right-handed batting shortstop, a changeup away. Charmin falls behind one to nothing, but that one, two, three, third inning was a statement frame for him. Absolutely. I think that's just the confidence. The way he bounced off the mound and into the dugout, that's stuff that we're, we're looking for from, from Josh. He goes back to back with the changeup. It's a called strike on the second. So count one ball, one strike to Myers, who popped out second baseman Horvat for the second out of the first inning. Horvat shaded a step towards the bag as Myers offers up on a breaking ball over the outer third. May have been a called strike anyway. Regardless, the count goes one ball, two strikes. It's Jeremy Lee awaiting on deck, and then the second baseman Peyton Miller hits third in the inning. Charmin toes the extreme third base side of the mound as he fires a curveball outside on one and two. Count now all square at two balls, two strikes. Charmin today sitting anywhere between 81 to 83 on the fastball. Going to win any contest in terms of the velo, but he is a slop throwing left hander that knows how to use all five of his pitches. Breaking ball, call for strike three. Josh Sharman strikes out the leadoff batter of the fourth. That's our Silver State Schools Credit Union strike out of the game. That was a great pitch sequence right, right there from uh, Josh. Keeping the ball on the outside corner of the plate, and then every time he's been able to get the ball back, he's ready to go. He's trying to get some pace to those pitches going right now, and I like the, the demeanor he's got up there on the mound. Jarman misses just off the inside with a fastball to Lee, who flied out to left field to end the first inning. That's three of the last five batters that Sharman has retired via the K. A couple of backwards Ks to end the third and begin the fourth. And is high with a fastball to move the count 2-0 and against Lee. And he'll take an extra second off the back of the mound. You can tell that there's something not quite right on that delivery. Yeah, he was working pretty fast right there. We're talking about pace and we're talking about sequence. He needs to settle down. That's a veteran right there that realizes that. Even something subtle as that, just taking an extra half a second, you take your cap off, walk around the back of the mound, makes a difference. Williams backs up on this ground ball, and it eats him up. That was a sharply struck ball that Williams commits his first defensive miscue. He had a throwing error earlier, but that defensive error will put the runner on first. As Lee hit that one hard, it just kind of ate him up as he took a step back. Yeah, he was kind of in a kind of a no man's land right there. He couldn't really decide whether he's going to come up and, and rush that ball or kind of back up and try to chest it. And, he, and he, when he's playing second base all these four last four years, he's had the, the time to make those decisions, right? At third base, you don't have that luxury. Here's the second baseman, Miller. 
Falls behind nothing and one on a fastball over the inner third. Yeah, a lot of times at, at third base, if you think it's too late, you just got to purely react. And as soon as Williams took that step back, you knew it was going to be trouble or at least not a clean delivery. Miller goes the other way. A slap ball that falls into shallow right field. Lee makes a turn at second but stops as right fielder Pimentel is able to cut it off. So an error followed up by a base hit will put two runners on with one out. Double play active anywhere around the infield, though, for the right-handed batting Jacob Weiss. And of course, we're not the only game going on. College baseball kicking off this weekend at the Division I level, and there's a ton of Mountain West teams in action in some really big-time contests. Yeah, Army and Air Force have faced off back east in uh, the Armed Forces Classic, I believe it is. Army taking the first, uh, the second game of this series, 6-4 to four over Air Force. Air Force, of course, without Paul Skeens, but uh, uh, Kula Singham, Sam Kula Singham, named to the Golden Spikes watch list. He's going to be a really tough out in Mountain West play later in the year. Yeah, Paul Skeens had a gem yesterday, starting as a Friday night pitcher for LSU. 12 strikeouts in six innings, no runs on two or three hits, something like that, but I definitely remember 12 strikeouts in six innings on 98 pitches, and you brought it up. His last pitch, his 98th pitch of the night was at 98 miles an hour. Hey, I love his success at LSU, as long as we don't have to face him a couple times this year. Of course, dominated UNLV in the Mountain West Tournament last year as he's swinging pop sky high, right side of the infield. First baseman Higgins calls off the second baseman Horvat. And the infield fly rule call with less than two outs. Runners on first and second. The out, regardless, both runners retreat. Lee back to second. Miller to first on the infield fly. Pop out by Weiss. Although Higgins will get credit for the put out as the closest defender to the ball. Yeah, again, that's one of those balls we talked about earlier. Gets up in this light blue sky. Really hard to judge at this time of day. And with the... Infield fly rule bailing the Rebels out there. You typically don't want your first baseman to have to go that far away from the line on a ball like that. Let your second baseman come in and make the grab almost where he was originally positioned. Correct. And second baseman Horvat was over there to make the play. I don't know if he was called off by Higgins, but inexperience at first base could come into play with this being the first season that Higgins is, uh, is playing at the bag. Here's Rylan Evans, the third baseman. He's ahead one ball and no strikes. He singled and then was picked off in the second. Here with two on and two out in the fourth inning. This ball's bounced in for ball two. 2-0 two to Rylan Evans. And plenty of other games going on, including a, a couple of teams that UNLV will face at various points of the year this season. Yeah, San Diego State playing at ASU. Arizona State up 4-0 in the bottom of the eighth. We'll see the Aztecs, excuse me, we'll see Sun Devils on Tuesday night. And then we'll be uh, have a three-game home opener for conference play at San Diego State in about a week and a half. That pitch in the dirt, check swing held up by Rylan Evans on the appeal. So the count, three ball, no strikes. This is the first 3-0 count that Josh Sharman has been up against all afternoon so far. Last ball over the inside for a called strike. Sharman, low, low, low walk number last year. 14 walks in over 75 innings of work. He was really efficient. That number boils down to a walk every five and a half innings. He was excellent in terms of keeping the ball in the zone last year. This one swung on, dribbled foul. It's in front of the plate. They're going to call him out. They're going to say that ball bounced in fair territory and then hit the runner, Rylan Evans. And the Rebels running off the field. They'll take it as that ball, almost a swinging bunt that hit the batter in fair territory. Chris Rodriguez is going to come out and argue, but we'll step aside as the Rebels sprint off the field after that one. No runs on one hit, one error, two men left on. And the Rebels do up in the bottom half of the fourth inning, batting with a 4-1 to one advantage.
back at home tomorrow to wrap up this series against Pacific. First pitch is set for 12.05 p.m. Don't forget that kids can join us after the game to run the bases. We hope to see you there. Four to one lead for UNLV, along with Dan Dolby, Matt Neverett with you from the Earl here on the campus of UNLV. Nine, one, and two, due up for the home side, and they'll do it against a new arm into the game, the Southpaw out of San Diego, Michael De Filippi, six foot one, two hundred and five pound graduate student, facing off against Gianni Horvat, then Ryland Charles and Santino Panaro. De Filippi in behind Quinlan Sweeney, who lasted one inning, gave up all the damage so far. Four runs on three hits and a walk, no strikeouts. Sweeney, the pitcher of record for Pacific, if the score holds. Here's Horvat in from the right side against the lefty Dave Filippi. Swings to the first pitch and pops it into center. Back goes Bobo. Still on the move as a center fielder. He lunges and can't make the catch. This one bounces off the base of the wall. Horvat stops it second with a leadoff stand-up double on the first pitch of the inning. And they were ready to go against the lefty out of the pen. Bobo playing a little bit shallow right there. That ball carried farther than I think he thought it was. It looked like he got a decent break, but didn't make a real hard sprint at the ball. So the ball was able to carry over his head and Horvat easily in the second base. That's one of the harder balls that we've seen Horvat hit here at Early Wilson Stadium over the last two years. The power coming along, the speed coming along, the progression of Gianni. Going to be really fun to watch over the last couple of years. The exit velocity on that two-bagger, 99 off the bat. He absolutely smoked it and sets up Ryland Charles with the runner in scoring position. A little second baseman with a 99 exit list. Velo's good. Not too bad. As Charles swings with the first pitch, hits it in the air to center, but it's shallow as Bobo charges and fights off the sun to make the catch. Two pitches, two balls in play to center. One for a double and one for an out. So the Rebels geared up against Dave Filippi out of the pen to be sure. One out, one on for Santino Panaro, who swung at the first pitch of the third against Sweeney and singled back up the middle on a ball that left the bat at 94. So a lot of hard contact on the first pitches of innings. Yeah, pretty interesting to see them swinging at the first pitch with a new guy coming out of the bullpen. Sweeney had a hard time finding the zone. Uh, we're going to see if uh, E. Filippi can find the zone here. Misses it down and inside on that pitch to Panaro, who's one of one with a single. The run scored in a walk. Whereas Quinlan Sweeney didn't have any action over three seasons and was a senior, left-hander Dave Filippi has pitched for four seasons coming into this year. The graduate student with a career 7 8 8 ERA, although just looking at the numbers, a situational left-hander prior to this season. Ground ball right side, down to the knee is the second baseman Miller as he picks it up on the third hop. Turns and fires one to first base in time to retire Santino. Back-to-back -back putouts after the Horvat leadoff double. Gianni standing 90 feet away at third as Jacob Sharp saunters in from the right side. Numbers for Dave Filippi last year. A season to forget. The ERA, in fact, has gone up every year for him. In 18 innings, or 18 appearances rather, spanning just over 20 innings, a 1-2 and two record and a 10-4-5 ERA for Dave Filippi. Opponents batted 352 against him a year ago. Sharp trying to put one in play here. Takes that breaking pitch outside. One ball, no strikes to the catcher who has struck out and walked. Scored a run when he did so in the third. Big gap up the middle with the second base with Miller towards the bag. Myers it short, shaded deep and away. Same deal with Bobo in center. They're playing sharp to pull. Bouncing ball, skips away from the catcher. Here comes Horvat, he slides in feet first and safely. Man, that one did not get too far away from the catcher Weiss, but it was an early decision. Turned out to be the right decision from Horvat to break. Yeah, if you watch Sharp at the plate, he was actually given the hold sign to Horvat. But Horvat had made a commitment. He was coming all the way. And by the time he got the hold from the batter, he was already into the slide. So that wild pitch will score Horvat from third. That's been the struggle for Pacific at least over the last two innings with Sweeney and DeFilippi has been the wild pitches. There was a pass ball mixed in there as well. So reception from pitcher to catcher has not been clean today for Pacific. Rebels now lead 5-1. to one. Here's the 2-0 pitch with the bases empty. Sharp 
loops it straight back. That'll clear the screen. He got that fastball low in the zone there on 2-0 and, and tried to hammer it. He had a similar outing in his first time up back in the first inning against the starter Smith where he was up 2-0 and, and swung at a pitch and fouled it back. Yeah, he's going to be pretty aggressive, I think, throughout the year. That's just kind of the nature. I love the, the he, he plays the plate the same way. Bouncing ball, watch for ball three. A lot of times you'll hear people talking about the hitters counts, and the main ones that they're referring to are two and zero oh and three and one. Sharpie has seen both of them here in a three pitch stretch. Yeah, and with the bases loaded, I think uh, Coach Higgins is given no indication of what he wants him to do. He's leaving that up to Sharpie. Nobody on, two outs, and a run across already in the fourth. There's the three one delivery from the left hander, Michael De Filippi. Ball four, an easy watch, and a ball that bounced in. Sharp takes his second walk in as many plate appearances. And that'll put another runner on, this time for Edarian Williams, who drove in a run on a base hit back in the third inning. Looking at a couple more scores from around the Mountain West. Bottom of the eighth, Fresno State leading Arizona 5-0 at the MLB Desert Invitational down in uh, Arizona. Bottom of the seventh, the team from up north trails Abilene Christian 4-2. That was after the Wildcats defeated the Wolfpack yesterday as well. Big looping curveball stays high. Call for ball one to E. And that's just a good indication that preseason polls mean nothing. As we say that, the Rebels picked to finish first for the first time ever. Although last year they were not picked to finish first, and they dominated offensively in the regular season. Looking to go back to back in terms of the regular season championships. And that's the first time they've ever been picked first in the, in the conference. And they've had some really good teams going into seasons before. Speaking of really good, a drive to right center field. Back goes Otis. Right fielder in front of the warning track, able to grab it. And that'll go a long way to do so. Another run added on. One run on one hit. Nowhere is in a man left on through four innings full. It's a four-run lead as UNLV on top of Pacific 5-1. The Rebel Athletic Fund is the team behind the teams, generating critical resources to support all UNLV student athletes. Learn more about how you can help graduate leaders win championships and help our student athletes excel at all that they do by visiting rebelathleticfund.com. Back out on top is Josh Sharman as we enter into the top of the fifth inning. UNLV on top of Pacific by a 5-1 to one score. And the Rebels, even for the second straight day, they fell behind one to nothing. It's their first deficit of the year. First pitch swinging is the right fielder Tony Otis. Puts a ball play to the right side. Grabbed by the second baseman Horvat and a bang-bang play at first to get us started. Goes the way of the Rebels here in the fifth. That was a slow roller that Horvat didn't necessarily have that sense of urgency on until the very end. Horvat could have made a little bit more press forward on that. Chose to go lateral, made the play a little closer than needed to be. Nonetheless, it goes as a put out. That'll bring up the right-handed batting first baseman, Caden Casagran. Scored that last one, 4-3 in the scorecard. Casagran grounded out to the shortstop back in the third inning. It was a nice grab made by Myro up the middle. And Getting ahead, one ball, no strikes, is Josh Sharman here. Sharman was dominant in the third, retired the side in four batters in the fourth. It's a foul 
foul ball, slapped to the right side here, and he's quickly ahead. No balls and two strikes against Pacific first baseman. Michael DeFilippi came in, gave up a leadoff double on the first pitch, and it was a wild pitch that brought the runner in. The run charge to the pitcher on an instance like that. Five runs on five hits for UNLV, one on three for the Tigers. Bouncing ball on nothing and two, blocked by Sharp. Like to see more of that from Sharman. He's pitching in his second career outing uh, against this Pacific team. Made the opening day start two years ago on the 8th of, or opening, I guess, day of that series. It was in the middle of April. That was a weird scheduling series against Pacific two years ago. It was right in the middle of Mountain West play. As this pitch in the dirt, swung on and missed. The throw down to first from the catcher, Sharp, is in time. That's where that strikeout, 2-3 on the putout. And two up and two away for Sharman, who struck out four over the last inning in two thirds. You know, that was a great pitch by Sharman, keeping that thing down low. But it was also a great play by Sharp. He didn't rush the, the, the throw down to first base, took his time, make sure he had a good angle to get over to Higgins for the out. So now two out, nobody on. Sharman trying to go one, two, three for the second time in three frames against basic high school graduate John Howard Bobo. So he takes a curveball in for a called strike. Bobo with a walk and a ground down, along with a stolen base so far today. We got uh, some information. They have a career after baseball for Bobo. Williams grabs this one just inside the third base bag. No play at first, and good job by Higgins to come off and stop that one on a short hop on the chest. I don't think Williams was ever going to have a play on that infield base hit. Bobo can fly on the path. Yeah, he did a good job getting a good break out of the box right there. But we did get some information that Bobo, being a Las Vegas native, is also a rapper. Young Bo, look him up. Young Bo. I'm not sure we can play his music here, but uh, yeah, he, he does have a career after baseball. Yeah, you can look it up on your own time. There's enough uh, resources nowadays. As that first pitch strike is into Ben Nemovant, the only left-handed batter in the lineup for Pacific. He's got the feet spread wide open and towing each end of the chalk line in the batter's box. Swings here, ropes this one up the middle, past a vacated second base position with Horvat shaded away. That roller into center field is his first base hit and puts two runners on with two down for Sharman. And that'll bring up the shortstop Chaz Myers, who's 0 for 2. Yeah, Horvat was shaded way over towards first base with uh, Myro moved over more towards the bag. Big hole right there, no chance of getting at that one. Myers digs in from the right. He popped out to second and struck out looking back in the fourth. It was back-to-back -back K's for Sharman to end the third and to begin the fourth. Dropped a nasty curveball in on Myers with two strikes. Pulls the string on a changeup here. It fades away from the right-handed batter who swings and misses for strike one. Yeah, Sharman's going to settle in right here. The, the, both of those balls, though, both of those singles weren't hit very hard. They were just hit in the right spots. For Sharman, one thing that he does especially well, you'll hear the term tunneling a lot, uh, basically, all five of his pitches come from the same arm slot, same release point. There's the fastball. It's tipped straight back, and he's ahead nothing in two. We'll say the one area where he's already improved on his performance from last year, last couple of years even, his first pitch strikes. He's going right after these hitters with that bulldog mentality that we had talked about. Yeah, he's getting ahead in the count each batter he's seeing now after the first two innings. Now he's got a chance at 0-1-2 to keep this ball down and low. Sharp's got to be on his toes behind the plate here. Could speed off both bases as well. Bobo off second. Nemovan with a huge lead off first. They're going to throw to second. Orvin has to leap to keep it from advancing to the outfield. Bobo back in standing. He saw that one early. Yeah, that was a called pick play from the dugout. But uh, Bobo being quick enough to get back. Take a look at Nemovant off first. No hold by Higgins, so he's out at least 15 feet off the base. Swing and a pop-up right side of the infield. First baseman Higgins underneath it. Calls off Gianni Horvat and is able to make the catch. A couple of two-out base hits stranded on. And Sharman has been strong as he's gone along through five innings. He's given up just the one run. The bats have backed him up. They'll look to add on when we return to Earl E. Wilson Stadium for the bottom of the fifth.
UNLV Rebels mobile app is free and compatible with both iOS and Android devices. So go download it today. UNLV baseball is back. No matter where you're watching this baseball season, be sure to buy a cold, crisp Dos Equis and say, go Rebels, get a dose. Enjoy Dos Equis responsibly, imported by Cervezas Mexicanas, White Plains, New York. Bottom of the fifth inning. Officially halfway home with four and a half down, four and a half to play. Second inning of work out of the bullpen for Pacific left-hander Michael DeFilippi begins with the number five, six, and seven spots. Due up for UNLV with Austin Krizik, Kate Higgins, and Alex Pimentel. First three due up against him. Watching all the way on a first pitch curveball inside is Austin Krizik. Hitless today, walked and popped out to right. He was two for four with a long ball yesterday that cleared the fence by just a couple of feet and left. Yeah, Krizik, our feature player last night on the Silver State Sports Entertainment Network broadcast. Local kid takes strike there, called low and away. But Krizik, uh, we talked about the impact of the local players uh, that uh, play here with the Hustlin' Rebels. We got 18 kids out of the 36-man roster from Las Vegas with another one coming from up north where Alan Charles out of Reno. No math guy, but that's exactly half, which is good for any team. As Charles, or rather Krizik, rolls this one up the middle. It was a sliding backhand attempt by the second baseman, Miller. It leads you to believe the ruling on that would be a base hit. Took the extraordinary effort that is in the rule book on a hit versus an error. I'd go base hit there. Correct. He had to cover quite a bit of ground. It would have been a backhand and a tough play at first anyways. That's the, the verbiage in the rule book. If you're curious on a, a diving play or something like that, it's if the fielder has to make an extraordinary effort, judging by the, the scorekeeper's discretion. So Krizik, with his third base hit of the year, reaches, and the Rebels looking to expand on their 5-1 to one lead. And the guy to have in the box to do so is Kate Higgins. He swings at a breaking ball, grounds it right to the shortstop. Myers to Miller. Second baseman's throw is late and picked out of the dirt by Casagran. So a fielder's choice will put Higgins to first. He scored 6-4 on the put out up the middle. Not the uh, look that you want, but you like the aggressiveness there because that's been top to bottom what we've seen here out of the bullpen. Correct, and they usually at that first pace pitch swinging, they've been expecting fastball. He got a curve ball away, which is able to get the barrel pushed towards left field right there. Easy play at second at, from shortstop over to get the lead runner, but Higgins runs well for a big man in the first baseman. UNLV top to bottom has speed in the lineup, and that's one thing that the coaching staff stressed to us a couple different times throughout the preseason. We were getting ready for yesterday in this opening series as Alex Pimentel, one of those speed demons, takes a called ball low on a bouncing ball blocked by the catcher Weiss. We said it yesterday, they're never going to be a team that steals a ton of bases, but they are already showing the aggressiveness has stepped up for sure on the base pass overall. Yeah, and it's pretty much top to bottom. You look at the, the first baseman and the DH or the slash right fielder, the pin plays, they got just as much speed as anybody else in that dugout. Pimentel can boogie. He tripled earlier. The ball to left center field. This one's bounced in the dirt all the way back to the backstop in a hurry. And Higgins moves from first to second on the wild pitch. Fifth wild pitch of the game, three of them thrown in one inning by Quinlan Sweeney. There was a pass ball in that inning as well, so we said it in the last inning. We'll say it again here in the fifth. That pitcher to catcher reception has not been there early for Pacific. That's something that develops throughout the year, especially with a young team, but the Rebels happy to take advantage here at the early part of the schedule. Yeah, it's so much inexperience on the mound for the Tigers. They're crossing up the catcher many times, and he's had to go out and talk to him about it a couple times also. His pitch low. Pimentel moves ahead three balls and no strikes. And when it gets to this count, we haven't seen a swing yet. The Rebels way more aggressive against DeFilippi than they were against Smith and even Sweeney. First base open. Lefty does not have to come anywhere near the plate. Paul Myro watching on deck. 
pass. Ball low. Call for ball four. Good miss, if you will. First three runners reaching in the inning. Krizik retired up the middle on a fielder's choice. And that brings up Paul Myra with two on, one down, and the Rebels leading five to one. You're talking about kind of a critical time in the game here in the bottom of the fifth. The Tigers don't want to go down by any more runs. So they were pretty cautious right there with first base open. But Paul Myro, power hitting guy with meant runners on first and second, they could blow this game open with the gapper. Myro in from the right, 0 for 2 so far. 2 for 4 in the win yesterday with four ribbies. Takes this pitch inside, lifts the hands over a fastball. And after the four pitch walk to Pimentel, Myro likely taking a strike. Uh, one area where the Rebels excelled last night, and it was why they were able to hold on to the 14 to 6 final, was just the fact that they added on to the picket fence. And here comes a, a mound visit from Elliot Cribby. There is a right hander getting loose in the pen. But this just to slope De Filippi down, buy some time for the guy in the pen. But uh, back to what I was saying, the Rebels last night scored four in the first, three in the second, one in the third, one in the fourth, and then single runs in the fifth and sixth before they were capped off for the night. But just building what they call that picket fence, just adding on. It is 5-1 lead, not necessarily safe. You want to get as many as you can, as often as you can. And that was one area where last year they were very, very good, led the country in hits, batting average, and doubles. Those are the types of things that we're seeing already here with the way that the lineup is very similar in terms of top to bottom consistency. Well, you're absolutely right. And they're just looking to pile on right now, right? With the consistency in the batters uh, that the Rebels have coming up to the plate, uh, batter after batter, anybody can make this game and blow it wide open. Myro with a home run yesterday. Would love another one here. Well, Oregon State Beaver checks the swing. They appeal to first, and Tim Vesey says no, he did not. Able to hold up on that pitch was Myro. Two balls and no strikes, so he didn't have the red light there. Started to go around, and maybe realized in the middle of the swing that he did. Yeah, DeFilippi is going to be looking to get something down in the zone right here, looking for the double play. Doesn't want to load the bases. Got hot hitting Horvat, who hit a, a high fly ball over center fielder's last step back. Yeah, that thing was a screamer off the bat at nearly 100 miles an hour. Yeah, we haven't seen that type of power from Horvat over the last year. So obviously strength conditioning as well as experience is coming into play for Gianni. 3-0 count to Myro with Gianni awaiting on deck. De Filippi working out of the stretch. He deals. Myro watching all the way. He knew that one was a called strike at the knees. Good pitch with some arm side runs. Started inside and moved over the heart of the plate from the left-hander. This may be a situation right here where the Rebels are going to get in motion. 3-1 count, one out in a 5-1 ball game. Second is Higgins. Pimentel off first. Higgins breaks from second, but the pitch way outside for ball four. So after a base hit, a fielder's choice, back-to-back -back walks. Sacks full with one out here in the fifth for Gianni Horvat, who will try to make an even bigger impact. He's doubled and flied out so far today. That, that was a situation right there with the hitter's count being three and one. You got the runners in motion. And given the fact that the last couple pitchers have had trouble finding the plate and the wild pitches coming into play, Higgins could have scored all the way from second on a wild pitch. He was on the move early, and he had a great jump as well. He's on third, Pimentel's on second, and Myro, after that five-pitch walk, awaits off first base for Gianni Horvat. After a first-pitch swing in his last at-bat, takes a first pitch from DeFilippi, a breaking ball for a strike. It's the, the recognition out of the hand. You typically don't want to swing at a first-pitch breaking ball. That's a pitcher's pitch by very definition. And I'm watching Bobo, who got uh, kind of burned last time with Hor uh, Horvat up to bat, kind of taking some steps back. Horvat takes a big hack, but fouls it straight back to move to nothing and two. Yeah, Bobo very deep. It now takes a couple of steps back towards center, but I mean, he was in front of the retired number 15 for Matt Williams. He was way over in left center, still way off the line and right as Otis. You would have never seen that alignment for Gianni last year. Number one, the, the amount of video changes how it's scouted, but number two, he's a different hitter. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Breaking pitch way upstairs, goes out of the glove of the catcher, De Filippi, or the catcher, Weiss, rather, De Filippi, sprinting towards the plate just in case. Would you like to see that out of the coaching staff? Yeah, again, we talked about it earlier, and that's why we got a mound visit from Coach Cribby. They're wanting to make sure that they're trying to limit the amount of damage that's done by the Rebels this inning. Chance to really crack this game open. UNLV be on top by four, but Gianni Horvat facing a 1-2 count with the bases loaded. Left-hander De Filippi deals. Horvat swings and misses at strike three. 
offered up, but that changeup fading away from him for out number two as Island Charles wraps the lineup back around to the top, steps in now for his fourth plate appearance of the game. A good pitch right there from Dave Filippi. Uh, we talked about the, the count for the batters and the advantage they have at the three and one, you know, the two and oh types. But with Dave Filippi being ahead in the count one and two right there, he had some options and he did a good job keeping that ball low with the breaking ball. Hadn't seen that change up too much either. Kind of pulled that out of the bag of tricks. There's the curveball here down and away taken by Charles for ball one. You're probably not going to see this batter being Ryan Ch Ryland Charles get fooled. He's a veteran and he's seen everything and he's very choosy. He'll keep the, the bat on his shoulder when necessary, but he's going to be aggressive right here. Great recognition on that last pitch. You can tell that he saw it out of the hand. Sees this one out of the hand as it clips the outside for strike one. Count goes even at one. Ryland Charles, who at 306, starting 13 out of 27 games two years ago as a true freshman. Last year, though, as a true leader, started every single game for UNLV, all 57, and he just batted a team high 382 on a team with the highest batting average in the country. It's way outside, moves it to two and one. Charles also started to run into some pitches. Six home runs, 46 driven in. The extended playing time to blame a lot for that. Yeah, and he's sneaky when it comes to the power game. He's going to put the ball in play, but he's also going to be able to drive it. And an OPS of just under 1,000. That's a pretty darn good mark, if you ask me. Here's his 2-1. Crushed high in the air to left center field. Center fielder back as Bobo stops. Still drifting, but is able to make the catch in front of the two retired numbers for Ryan Ludwig and Matt Williams. And the Rebels strand the bases loaded, holding on to a 5-1 lead after five innings full from early Wilson. Top of the six from UNLV, the Hustlin' Rebels on top of the Tigers from Pacific. They have five to one score. Middle third of the lineup, four, five, six, due up for the visiting side against Josh Sharman, who's set in delivering his 66th pitch of the afternoon. It's crushed by Jeremy Lee down the line and left, but this one drifting well foul. Lee, with the most pop in this lineup, has shown it off this weekend on a pair of foul balls, if you include last night's game. He has some real pop to the left side. That's probably the hardest ball that the Tigers have hit today. Likely, yes. Jarman has induced a ton of weak contact. He's got three, make it four strikeouts as well. Lee chops it to the left side. Nice backhand grab by the third baseman Williams. A high throw glove on a nice stretch by Higgins over at first base. Put an exclamation point next to that one. That's a great grab and throw by Edarian Williams as he settles into that third base position for the out. Yeah, we talked about it last night. He's got the arm strength. It's just a matter of getting the feet position. He did a really good job right there. Got down low and to, to make sure that that ball didn't get by him. Made a strong throw first out of the inning. So far, so good in the sixth. 67 pitches, 45 strikes for Sharman. As the second baseman Miller squares to bunt, pulls it back on a pitch that misses high. Miller 
Had a bunt single in the second inning. And it was the two base error on the pickoff move by Sharman. That allowed Jacob Weiss, who waits on deck, to drive in the only run on a sacrifice fly. Only run for Pacific today. So Miller doesn't square here. Takes a fastball low, two balls and no strikes. Miller also followed it up with a base hit on a roller up the middle in the fourth inning. So two for two, the only multi-hit effort for the visitors so far this afternoon. With our limited view down in the Rebels uh, bullpen, looks like we've got a couple guys up stretching. Uh, but with Sharman at, you know, dealing right now, pitch count being relatively low, heading into the top of the sixth, well, I, I'm not sure we're going to be looking at a pitching change here very soon. Yeah, for Sharman, you'd like to get him through at least six, but he has been a guy in years past that you can trust to at least go seven. He's been very, very durable and dependable, mainly because he doesn't try to overthrow. This is high here with a changeup to move the count to three and one. But he's been really efficient today, even more so than in years past. Yeah, and if we can get more innings out of Josh today, it just sets us up for the rest of the week, right? With the game tomorrow, game Tuesday night, and then a four-banger next weekend, we're going to need all the arms we can get. Line drive, base hit through the left side of the infield as Miller continues his perfect day. Second baseman now three for three. And that ball with a higher exit velocity than his two previous base hits, including a bunt likely combined. One on, one out, double play active up the middle for Weiss, who to this point has driven in the only run for Pacific on a sack fly, as we mentioned in the second. Also popped into an infield fly rule in the fourth. You know, and it, five to one in the, in the top of the sixth, there are teams that could play small ball, but you can't do that against the Rebels. Especially this one as it's ripped down the left field side fair into the corner for extra bases. Getting the wave around third is Miller as Krizik struggles to pick it out of the corner. He'll score easily, and the catcher, Weiss, lumbers into third with an RBI triple. It's a 5-2 to two game, and Weiss has driven in both runs for the Tigers. Yeah, just as we talked about Sharman eating up some innings, got himself into a little trouble right now. Left the ball up over in the right-handed batting catcher was able to pull right down the line just inside the bag. That's been about the only success that Pacific has had offensively, at least in the small sample size of the last two games, is sneaking them inside that third base bag. Yeah, that ball wasn't hit exceptionally hard, but it was able to find the spot and work down in the corner in the left field uh, outfield. Here's Rylan Evans. Right-handed batting third baseman who has a ball skip past him. Sharp can't keep it in front and Weiss touches it up. It's a 5-3 to three game. Pass ball will bring in Weiss, who's made a big impact in this game. Two RBIs and a run scored. It has been the Weiss and Miller show offensively for Pacific. Now we're seeing a little bit more activity down the Rebel bullpen. Um, Sharman just needs to settle down right here. He's not tired. He just needs to get make sure that he's throwing within what he does. He had that bulldog mentality earlier. We need to get him to get back to that. One out, base is empty, and another line drive screamer hit over the head of the shortstop, Myro, into left field. It's the third straight hit against Charmin. Miller, Weiss, and Evans getting to him here in the sixth inning. And that'll bring the tying run to the plate all of a sudden. Five to three game. It's the right-handed batting right fielder, Tony Otis. And here comes, it's like Stan Stolte emerging from the dugout. Corey Vander. That's Corey. Corey and Stan always mess me up by both wearing the batting practice. They, they both... Don't have a lot of hair. They yeah. both wear the same hat. They are very similar look. They both walk similarly as well out to the mound. They do. Uh, and I think Coach Stolte would find that more flattering than Coach uh, Vanderhood. I'll make sure to mention it to Stan, but not to Corey next time I, I talk to them, that they always trip me up by, by looking similar. But nonetheless, what's this conversation like? I know we kind of have touched on it, but if you're Corey, what do you say to Josh? Because these two have known each other for so long, there really is not much you know, physical coaching going on. It's more on the mental side here. All he's doing is getting them, uh, well, first of all, he may be buying some time to get some bullpen action going. But he's, uh, he's going out there and telling him, hey, listen, we can hit with anybody in the country right now. All I need you to do to be your job is limit the damage right now. Okay, we got one out in the top of the six. They got three across the board to this inning. We can blow this game open at any time. I just need you to keep the ball low and away. So as mentioned, here's Tony Otis. Checks the swing, holds up on a first pitch changeup that misses off the outside. Hey, every now and then, Sharman, when he runs into trouble, it's when he tries to be too cute with it, tries to aim it instead of throwing it. I think that one was a, a victim of circumstance there. Yeah, it's a good good analogy right there. The pickoff throw to first. Again, Sharman with that really swift move, uh, but runner back in easily. Exactly what you said. We, we just got to get up, throw the ball, and let our talent take over from where we were early in the game. 
Well, they throw to first, back in easily, and head first is Rylan Evans. That's what you hear coaches talk about, trust your mechanics. You shouldn't be thinking about where you're going to throw it. You have your spot, and it's up to the, the mechanics to be able to get it there. So that's what repeatability can do for you. Ground ball through the left side. A well-struck base hit by Tony Otis. Puts the tying run on base here in the top half of the sixth inning. It's the fourth straight hit all to that side of the infield. And the quick emergence from Stan Stolte will end the day for Josh Sharman. So that'll move Ryland Evans up to second. Otis to first. And we'll keep an eye on who emerges from the UNLV bullpen. But regardless, after the first down, four straight hits, including an RBI triple at Pacific, very much back into this game. As we step aside here for the pitching chain, jogging out is Sam Simon. As we step aside for the pitching change, be back in a moment. UNLV leading 5-3. to three. Josh Sharman out after five and a third innings. We're here in the top of the sixth inning. Five to three lead for UNLV. With runners on first and second. It'll be Sam Simon in to try to clean up here in the sixth. Caden Casagrande in from the right side to first baseman. Standing in after four straight hits, including an RBI triple from Jacob Weiss here in the sixth inning. Simon, the right-hander, out of Centennial High School in Las Vegas. Misses away. Balls behind Casagrande. In the partial line for Sharman who's responsible for both runners on base. Five and a third, three runs, one earned thus far on nine hits. Walked one, which is about what you're going to see from Sharman. Struck out four. Simon induces a ground ball, foul. Nice snag made in foul territory by the third base coach. And count goes one ball, one strike to Sam Simon. Throwing to Caden Casagrande. Simon in his second year after going two and one with a 4-5 ERA in 13 outings last year, including a spot start. What's the read on Simon? What is his go-to pitch? Sam's not going to overpower you, but he does have some pretty good gas with his fastball. One of the things about you notice Simon this year, and you see that with a lot of college baseball players that come in and play as freshmen, his frame is really filled in. He's got that, like we talked about, that projected frame, the projected uh, velocity that you're going to get out of a pitcher. He's put, probably put on 15 to 20 pounds, and most of it's muscle. So it's going to be interesting to see how he comes out this year with his fastball. Let's say it's 6'3", 200 pounds. Gives up a fly ball deep to left field. Krizik drifting back. Both runners tagging up. Kriz makes the grab. Neither runner advances as the throw goes back to second. So far, so good for Sam Simon in his debut. Gets the first out via a fly out to left. And with two outs, two on, including the game's tying run. It's the top of the lineup in John Howard Bobo. And you see at the plate, Casagrande and Bobo meeting and discussing. That's something that you developed throughout college in this young Pacific team, looking for some more of that, saying, hey, what did you see? What's he throwing, especially the only batter to face the first guy out of the pen? Yeah, you're going to see that from a lot of hitters as that ball's low in, in the dirt, but uh, Sharp makes a good stop. You're going to see the guy walking out from the batter's box to a, a player that's either made an out or maybe gotten a hit um, but to, he's, uh, what he's going to say is 
Check swing ground ball charged by the shortstop. Myro, the flip to Horvat is in time, but it's dropped. Horvat never had that thing in the glove, and the inning continues. Yeah, Myro made a good play rushing in to, to get that ball that was slowly hit, but Horvat wasn't able to hang on to that thing, and I think we're going to have a, an E on four there, Horvat. Yeah, fielder's choice given to Bobo. The error charged to Horvat, allowing Otis to move from first to second. So because of the fielder's choice E6, that loads the bases for Ben Nemovan, the eighth hitter of the inning. Ground ball to short, backhand grab made by Myro. He'll go the long way to first this time. Beautiful stretch by Cade Higgins. As those handies are going to feel that one tomorrow, but it does the job, records the final out of the sixth inning, and strands the bases loaded. But Pacific plates two runs on four hits. They strand three on, and all of a sudden, we've got ourselves a ball game into the bottom of the sixth. A new arm coming out of the bullpen for Pacific. We'll tell you who it is next. Bottom of the sixth inning here from early Wilson Stadium, and the Rebels still lead Pacific, but the lead getting a bit tighter in a 5-3 to three contest. Santino Panaro, Jacob Sharp, and E. Darian Williams, the first three batters, do up here in the sixth, and they'll do so against the third arm out of the bullpen for Pacific. The right-hander, Caden Duke, deals high and inside, corkscrewing Panaro into the ground. And home plate umpire Alberto Ruiz turning out of the way of that pitch as well. So the 6'2", 220-pound sophomore out of Tracy, California, falls behind 1-0. and Panaro, 1-for-2 with the base hit and a walk so far. Takes a strike over the outside, even the count. Duke in behind Michael DiFilippi, who through two innings, gave up a run on two hits while walking three and recording just one strikeout, but he was effective. Slowed down the offensive momentum for UNLV and it makes number four and five. Here's Duke in the sixth, missing outside on a breaking pitch that didn't break. That thing was out of the hand funky, and Panaro moves ahead two balls and one strike. Duke has a very violent move at the top of his delivery. Yeah, two-way player last year for the Tigers. Made 26 appearances in the field, 18 on the hill. First of the 2023 season begins with a 3-1 and one count to Santino Panaro. In terms of pitching, 18 outings, one start. He was 0-1 with a 6-4 ERA, although he threw just 19 and two-thirds innings. So a spot reliever out of the pen. This is high here for ball four. A five-pitch walk is the second of the afternoon for Panaro. And the all-important insurance runs heading down to first base as Jacob Sharp stands in. And two runs on four hits and an error in the top half of the sixth inning. And Sharman's afternoon ends with a final line of three runs. Just one earned on nine hits. We're walking one and striking out four over five and a third. 
As we keep an eye on the Sharp at bat, your thoughts, Dan, on the Charmin outing to start the year? You know, for the first outing of the year, very pleased. We saw some of that bulldog mentality we talked about. Started to labor there, maybe getting a little tired. But all in all, I think that was very effective for him. He didn't get all of the help he needed to in the field at times. Um, had a couple of errors and a couple of balls we might have been able to get to later on in the season. But overall, I think Charmin uh, delivered what we were looking for today. And Charmin, as you mentioned, that sixth inning, you could see the wheels start to come off because he was ultra efficient in innings three for, through five. That was when he was at his best, but then just kind of ran into a wall. And Sharp swings and misses. Count now, no balls and two strikes against the Rebel backstop. Sharp has walked twice, struck out once, came after he went three for four with a triple and a pair of RBIs in his debut yesterday. Off of first is Panaro, a good sized lead as Duke deals from the stretch. Sharp goes the other way, puts a sting into this one to right center. Otis, the right fielder, just in front of the warning track, makes the catch. And Panaro has to sprint back to first. He was nearly standing on second. Sharp really struck that one well, but Otis able to track it down. Yeah, a lot of times with the wind blowing out here at early Wilson Stadium, that might, ball might have carried. But we got a little slight wind coming in straight from center field, so held that thing up. Right fielder able to get over there and make the play. One out with Panaro still at first. And here's a Darian Williams who drove in a run on a base hit to the left side in the third. Panaro breaks, first pitch swinging his E in a line drive, knocked foul out of play. We'll send Panaro slowly walking back to first. He's going to catch his breath after that pitch was smoked by E. Darian, but Duke, who's sitting anywhere from 89 to 92 on a fastball so far, gets ahead of the Rebel third baseman. That's the aggressiveness we've been referencing for the last two ball games. Now, the Rebels in past seasons may not have been going with the hit and run right there, but again, Adarian batting cleanup, he's gonna be a contact hitter. We're looking for him to get something into the gap. You know, one offering from Duke, a beautiful 12-6 breaking ball that tumbles over the top of the zone for a call strike two to Adarian Williams, who has hit two ground balls to the left side and popped out to right field back in the fourth in his last time up against DeFilippi. UNLV looking for a couple of tack on runs as Pacific has found some offensive light here in the middle innings. Round ball up the middle, past the shortstop, Myers and into center field. A 90-foot advancement for Panaro on Edarian Williams' second hit of the game. They both advance another 90 feet. Is that ball not fielded cleanly by the center fielder Bobo? And Williams makes him pay. Yeah, Bobo kind of got a little lazy right there. Had the ball in his glove, dropped it, went to pick it up with his bare hand and dropped it again. So that'll be charged as an error to the center fielder because the, otherwise the runners would not have advanced. So that's a big, costly error, especially given the way that and this one is gone. So Williams moves up to second. Panaro up to third, all on a fielding error by Bobo. Let's see what you hear coaches talk about. You can't compound one error into two, or one mistake into two there. Yeah, and a, but a great piece of hitting right there. Game behind in the count. All he did was take it wherever he could. Austin Krizik takes that 12-6 hammer curveball through the top of the zone. That's a real plus pitch for Duke, who throws his fastball upper 80s, low 90s as well. A great two-pitch mix out of the pen. Sophomore, as mentioned, was a two-way player last year. And there's a reason he's making his season debut on the hill. As the catcher, Weiss, goes out to have a word. He batted 182 in 26 appearances, was 4 of 22, but two of those four hits were for a home run. So power on both ends for Duke, a power pitcher, a power batter, and, of course, we're in the second game of the season. And we'll see if they use him in the lineup this year, but... Definitely, at least so far, like the look in a small sample size of what we've seen from him on the hill. Yeah, not overpowering, but good location that uh, fastball so far has been 89 to 92. Shaded deep in the outfield, especially Otis and right. As Duke misses this pitch outside to even up the count to Krizik, who has singled, walked, and flied up to straightaway center. Base hit came in the fifth inning on a line drive. He flied out to right in the third after walking back in the first. Batting with two runners in scoring position and a two-run lead here in the sixth. Another curveball. Beautiful location dropping low and outside for strike two. Yeah, that ball started high and tight for against Krizik, the right-handed batter, but dropped right into the zone. So with Kate Higgins watching on deck. Rizik just trying to put a ball in play here and make Pacific make the play defensively. There's the breaking ball. Hacked down and missed by Krizik for the out. Three, three straight breaking balls right there. 
really good pitching sequence right there from Duke. Now with first base open, they might be a little bit uh, cautious with the left-handed hitting Kate Higgins up at bat. Especially after the debut last night, Higgins not necessarily the same numbers today, but he's been effective walking and scoring a run in the third. He reached on a fielder's choice in the fifth, and he struck out to end the first inning. The Rebels have struck out just four times today. Tried the curveball moving down towards the back foot, but Higgins saw it out of the hand and took it for a called ball one. In fact, just looking down at the scorecard, both teams with just four strikeouts, and we're almost through six innings of play. Balls in play, not only today, but throughout this whole weekend, expected. Yeah, again, we talked about the Tigers, and uh, Coach Rodriguez got to be pretty happy for being pretty scrappy the way his team's playing. Check swing by Higgins. They appeal down to third. Yes, he did, says the third base umpire, Tyler Schmidt. So, rung up on the appeal. The count goes even at one to Higgins. Looking at the alignment right now, Otis out in right field is playing almost on the warning track. So, anything hit between the gap. We're, you're looking at two runs scoring. Now shortstop Myers shaded up the middle as well, partially to keep an eye on the runner. As this pitch rides inside and hits Higgins. So first base open. You typically want to stay away from the zone. I don't think that Duke nearly meant to go that in, or that far inside, rather, as it loads the bases for Alex Pimentel, who's tripled already today. Now batting number 22, Alex. An opportunity here for the Rebel right fielder, as we've been talking about for the last couple of innings. They're just looking for somebody to break this game open. Yeah, it's almost felt like this for about three innings for the Rebels, and we haven't really put anything on the board in those those, uh, those boxes. But Pimentel's the guy to do it. Pimentel takes in, called for ball one. The Rebels have left the bases loaded twice. They did it in the first, and they did it in the very most recent inning in the fifth. Pacific did it in the sixth, so it's been a endemic for both of these teams today. Nowhere to put Pimentel. Here's the 1-0 offering from Caden Duke. Chest-high fastball that Pimentel backed out of the way of. In for a called strike one. Outside of that triple that drove in a run in the third, Pimentel has been hit by a pitch and walked. So he's been on every time he's been up so far. And if he does that here, he'll drive in at least one run. Long Beach State dirt bag in from the right side. Here's the 1-1 one, one offering. That's high on the fastball. Pimentel saw it out of the hand. And three years at Long Beach State in the Big West, in one of the top schools on the West Coast, a career 242 batter. Struggled with some injuries over the last couple of years. A year ago, it was a 212 hitter with two home runs, seven RBIs in 33 outings. This one's grounded up the middle. Diving is the second baseman Miller. He can't get it. It trickles into shallow left center field as two runs score. And the Rebel lead has been doubled from two to four. It's now a seven to three game. Great piece of hitting right there by Pim. Just taking the ball where he, he could get it, getting right past Duke. Now Miller got at second base, got his glove on it. Actually, may if he doesn't do it, Bobo comes in, and Adarian may not be able to advance home on that. But because he pushes the ball out towards left field, Adarian scores easily. So two RBI single scores, two runs, and look at this. Kate Higgins limping off the field. He came up and immediately pointed down something wrong. What looks like one of the lower extremities, and Higgins is going to quickly jog towards the first base home side dugout as Braden Murphy emerges to pinch run. So. Definitely something you don't want to see is they'll tread lightly with Kate Higgins. Yeah, and, and uh, knowing Kate since he's been a, a little guy, you know, he, he's a tough kid. He's coming out because he's hurt. You know, th this early into the season, you want to be sure that you don't you don't cost yourself an opportunity later in the year by trying to, to come back too soon. So we'll definitely keep an eye on that as Braden Murphy pinch running for him at second. Paul Myro standing in. Two RBI base hit from Alex Pimentel has it back to a four-run advantage. And Paul Myro, the fourth, looking for his first hit of the day. Well, for two with the walk, and we'll keep an ear out for any news involving Kate Higgins over the next couple of innings. One of the things I liked about Higgins, he, he's hurt, but he pops up and he gets to the dugout on his own. He's not waiting for somebody to come get him. Overhand curveball, tumbling through the top of the zone once more for called strike one to Myro. That's been a weapon for Duke so far. Rebels have... Not seen that pitch well out of the hand, and he's dropped more of them than not in for strikes. 
Myra walked in his last plate appearance, popped out to short and grounded out to third. It's a ball on the ground that direction once more. Moving to his left is the third baseman, Evans. His throw to first is in time. But the Rebels add on a couple of very important insurance runs driven in. Overall, two runs on just one hit, one error, and two runners left on base, including the pinch runner, Braden Murphy. We'll see who goes to play first base for UNLV when we come back after six innings full. The score, UNLV 7, Pacific 3. Three, four, five, two up for Pacific in the top of the seventh. Another running atop the mound for Sam Simon. And after Braden Murphy pinch ran for Kate Higgins, who came up lame after a slide in the second, Murphy will remain in the game at first. Haven't seen him there yet with the Rebels, but we'll get it going here in the seventh with a fastball high just off the outside from Sam Simon in his second inning of work after coming in in relief for Josh Sharman. Chaz Myers, the shortstop, 0 for 3 thus far. Swings and taps this one straight back, and the cap goes even at one. So the Rebels adding on with two runs on two hits and a costly error. And it basically allowed both of the runs to advance and eventually score that inning by the center fielder Bobo. Pretty interesting with Murph going over to first base. This kind of completes the defensive cycle for him. Ground ball, ripped right to the third baseman Williams. He's up in front of it, and the throw to Murphy is in time to first. So Murphy into the game with a put out at first base and a better play by Edarian over at third. So we've seen some infield shuffling over the last couple of years. Three of the four infielders in the game right now were at different positions just a year ago. Correct. And uh, the play by Edarian there at third base is just an indication of what we're going to continue to see from him as he uh, gets more innings in. Jeremy Lee swings to the first pitch and fouls it straight down for his strike. Lee 0 for 3, reached on an error by Williams in the fourth. It was a slow roller that he tried to come in and grab on the bare hand. The throw was way down the line. Pulled at that point Higgins off the bag. And it's Braden Murphy at first here in the seventh in game two of three. Simon misses just off the outside. Two, a ball and a strike to Lee, who also flied out to left field in the first. After Lee is Peyton Miller, who has yet to be retired today. Three for three, awaiting on deck. Simon drops that one low and outside, and we'll see what the leash looks like. It's been an interesting new look bullpen this year. A couple of the names that were brought up early that have not been brought in. We will see them over the weekend were Jack Selinger and Sam Simon's older brother, Zach. We haven't seen them yet. Again, likely will over the next day or two. Sam Simon throws a slider over the inside for a called strike, but Nick Rupp yesterday going four innings, tying a career high. So we may see some new roles this season. He pops it up straight away to center field. Charles a couple of steps towards right center. On the move, center fielder able to track it down. Two up and two away for Simon, who's retired four of the five batters that he's faced so far. And that's what uh, Corey Vanderhoek, pitching coach for the Rebels, is looking for from Simon, the younger Simon. At last inning, he's hitting 87 to 89. He's picked up a couple points on his fastball from last year. So the maturity level, the, the body development, I think is what uh, they're going to be really pleased with. He's working exclusively out of the stretch, trying to do what Josh Sharman could not. And that's retire the man in from the right, Peyton Miller, second baseman, three for three, including a bunt base hit. Three singles, he's scored two runs. Rips this one on the right side. Horvat can't get it. And the second baseman, four for four, with a foursome of base hits. That one it was probably the slowest tap of all of them that weren't the bunt. Horvath thought he might have had a chance. He was shaded away from first base. 
with the right-handed hitter in, so Miller taking advantage of the positioning and reaches again for the fourth time today. And that, uh, that ball had a lot of topspin on it, and that second bounce, it, it bounded into right field. Sam Simon trying to limit the damage to the two-out base hit. It's a big swing and a miss. Pulled the string on a breaking ball ahead of Jacob Weiss, who tripled to left field in his last time up. Kind of just rolled it into the corner. Was able to bring home Miller from first base. Lines this one right to the shortstop, Paul Myro. He grabs it at the belt, and that'll be it for the top of the seventh. Brings us to the stretch break at Earl E. Wilson Stadium, and the Rebels do up in the bottom of the seventh, trying to add on to their four-run lead. Coming out of the stretch break in the bottom of the seventh inning, new left fielder for Pacific is Chase Greaves in for Ben Nemovan. 9-1-2 due up offensively for the Hustlin' Rebels who lead Pacific 7-3. Gianni Horvat followed by Ryland Charles and Santino Panaro up against Caden Duke, hard throwing right-hander who turns Horvat away on a fastball up by the brim. So Duke pitching in his second inning of work after giving up a couple of runs on a couple of hits in the sixth. He's trying to stretch it. But there are a couple of bodies up down the left field side for the Tigers. Horvat twists this one down the right field side, fading and dropping foul on the warning track. That one will go as strike two to Hor or strike one to Horvat rather after two pitches. There is action in the UNLV bullpen. A couple of guys during the inning break heading down there, and someone's getting loose. And there's a couple of bodies, as mentioned, getting loose for Pacific in the other corner. The game. Warm-ups as Horvat takes a curveball. Top of the zone for a called strike. Now the count, one and two. That curveball, Duke has thrown that in there more and more often as he's gone through the lineup. Looking quickly out of the full wide. There's the curveball here, Horvat. A cap shot off the end of the bat down the first base side. Duke calls off the first baseman and wins the foot race to the bag himself. He liked the look and ultimately won it. Score that one, one unassisted in the scorecard at home. And that rips the lineup back to the top as Ryland Charles Looks to improve on his second hit of the day. He's one for four with three flyouts straight away to center field in his last three at-bats. And here comes the pitching coach, Elliot Cribby, and it'll be a new arm facing off against Ryland Charles. The Rebels up seven to three. We'll step aside for the pitching change here in the bottom of the seventh inning.
now pitching for Pacific number 43, Owen McWilliams. Right-hander Owen McWilliam coming in. It'll be the fifth pitcher of the game used by Pacific. McWilliam, a sophomore out of Bainbridge Island, Washington, standing 5'11", 185 pounds, came in yesterday as a defensive replacement in center field for John Howard Bobo. So after the two-way player Caden Duke, another two-way player Owen McWilliam, except this time it's McWilliam squaring off against Charles in the seventh. First pitch outside to begin the appearance, and it's the first collegiate pitching outing for McWilliam, who was an offensive player last year, played last night, had a couple of at-bats, and is now pitching for the first time, so another two-way arm. I believe this is the fifth two-way arm we've seen over the last two nights. As Charles takes high, two balls and no strikes. Yeah, McWilliam came in last night for John Howard Bobo and struck out twice and walked in the ninth inning. So making this collegiate pitching debut today. Came after he batted 0 for 11 last year. So they're trying to kind of find a spot for him. They like him, but they want to find a spot for him. And he falls behind three balls and no strikes to Charles. You think the, the emotions are going for him after his first start or first actual college pitching outing. Falls behind 3 and 0 to the first batter. Charles watching all the way. Takes that pitch right down Broadway for a called strike one. And, and now Charles with the option to do whatever he wants here. Well, if you've ever been to Bainbridge Island, it's one of the prettiest places that you could uh, you could be in the United States when the weather's good. When a called strike to Ryland Charles, he disagrees on that pitch that was up and away. That's happened a couple of times today, exclusively almost to Ryland Charles. That pitch off the outside called for a strike against him, and this one brings the count full. He's got a pretty good eye, and he's been disappointed by a couple of those that he thinks is off the plate. McWilliams said, here's the full count offering. Charles skies it to shallow left field. Charging is the new left fielder, Greaves. Stops, reaches up, and makes the catch. Two up and two away here in the bottom of the seventh inning. First by Duke, then by McWilliam. Santino Panaro will try to avoid a 1-2-3 inning. Now batting number eight, Santino Panaro. Panaro has walked twice, singled once, grounded out to second as well. He's scored two of the seven UNLV runs today. Seven runs on eight hits. Pacific out hitting UNLV with 10, which is three runs to show for it as they've left a number of runners on base, especially over the last couple of innings. Yeah, leaving 10 on the, the bases for the Rebels is not uh, a good habit that they've had in the last few years. Um, I think it might be an anomaly today, but uh, they got to start stringing some things together. That situational hitting, almost like a pitcher's command, something that develops throughout the year. You can improve it, and especially when they get the confidence to, you know, hit and run a little bit more, kind of get them some base runners in motion. As Bernardo takes up, count one ball, one strike. It's, it's interesting to see early in the season and then compare late in the season the, the strategies and how the coaching staff kind of does things early in the year, unless you have a very specific skill set as a team. You're just kind of letting your guys go out there and seeing what you have. Well, it's situational, and it's also you've you got the book on the pitchers as the, the season goes on, right? So you know a little bit more what the tendencies are, so you're able to kind of be a little more calculated in your approach at the plate. Two and one the count to Santino Panaro, serving as a designated hitter today after starting in right field yesterday. Alex Pimentel out in right today and blowing towards left field here late in the game. Takes a strike down and outside, bending at the knees as he does so. And it's two balls, two strikes, two outs to the number two batter, Santino. 
It's interesting. That ball to us looks like it's off the plate. We don't have an exact view straight behind the, the umpire and the catcher. Um, maybe that's something we should talk about, too, because everything being automated these days. Bernard laces this one to left, but later around on that fastball, bounces it into the left field bullpen with one hop. And we have the, the luxury up here in the booth to see the stat tracker, right? So we, we know where the pitches are. We know velocity. We know movement. Um, but, I mean, you working for the aviators, we're in a different world where we have robots calling games now. Yeah, I always like to say that the umpire behind the plate, he's not calling balls and strikes, he's signaling them because he gets a, a note in his ear one way or the other, and he's just kind of relaying the information that he's given. Bonaro pops it up, shallow to left field, charging his Greaves. Going back is the shortstop, Myers. It'll be the left fielder to make the grab as Greaves comes in. And the side retired in three batters. So Owen McWilliam, his first pitching outing of his collegiate career, goes well. Two lazy flyouts to left, and we've played seven. The score, seven to three. First pitch from Sam Simon back out for another rating of work. Misses down and outside. Bottom third of the lineup, two up for the Pacific Tigers. Ryland Evans, Tony Otis, and Caden Casagrande is the second pitch. Misses low as well. Ryland Evans moves ahead. Two balls, no strikes. UNLV on top, seven to three here in game two out of three against Pacific to kick off the 2023 campaign. Right-hander warming up for Pacific in their bullpen. And the Leash for Simon a little bit longer than he has in years past. Gets a ground ball, chopped foul. He's grab made by a bench bat for Pacific. We saw Nick Rupp yesterday go four innings, tying a career high. Simon came in with one out in the sixth inning. Got the final two outs there and all three outs in the seventh and likely going to be entrusted with all three in the eighth if he can get there. This one's fouled straight back. And it gives you the option on a Sunday when you really haven't burned a lot of your big bullpen arms when you get performances like Rupp yesterday and Simon today. Well, absolutely. And what it does, it sets us up for Sunday. But again, we talked about it. It sets us up for the next week also. Roller to the left side, charged by the shortstop, Myro. who glove in front of the left foot. Beautiful transfer and throw all in one motion in time for the out. That is a major league play at shortstop, and that is about as slick a fielding play as you'll see in the infield. Yeah, you see the arm slot on his release on his throw to first. It's, it's actually coming from the submarine, right? He's throwing it down by his knee getting enough on it to make the out easily at first base. The only way to do that is to just take a bunch of ground balls. There's no way to learn that. Nobody does that inherently. The only way to do it is to just take a bunch of ground balls and improve. Well, you talked about the, the pitching mechanics. That's just habit for a, a shortstop like that. They're going to be making throws from all different arm positions, but it all comes with experience. Pop fly, shallow to right. Dropping back is the second baseman, Horvat, as he gloves it with two hands above the head. It's your perfect technique for the out. Two up and two down here in the eighth inning. Standing in the way of a perfect frame is Caden Casagrande. I think the Myro juxtaposition with Adarian Williams at third is a perfect one. Myro, a natural shortstop, and playing there all his life. You can see just even how for a natural athlete like Adarian Williams, who is a very adept fielder, you can see he's thinking out there. And with Myro, it's just all purely reactionary and feel. Yeah, it's just habit, and, and he's been, he, he, think about the number of ground balls he has taken in his life at shortstop. Right? This just becomes, it's just a creature of habit. 
after missing low. Second pitch over the inner third from Simon and for a called strike to Casagrande, who's grounded out, struck out, and flied out of his three at bats so far this afternoon. Here in the top of the eighth inning, the Rebels leading the Pacific Tigers 7-3. to three. Pitch outside from Simon moves it to 2-1. and one. Simon so far has allowed just one base hit, two total base runners, including a fielder's choice, and induced a lot of weak rollover contact. This one hit strongly, but on the ground, pulled foul on the third base side by Casagrande. And the count now two and two with the bases empty and two down. You know, I, I, I love seeing what I'm seeing from Simon right now. We'll see what he does with Casagrande right here. But I'm thoroughly impressed with the way that Simon's come in and handled this game. Pitching with tempo, gets another chopper to Myra at short. Loves it at the chest, sets the feet, and fires a strike over to Murphy at first. How about the one, two, three inning for Sam Simon? Making it look easy. And the Rebels do up in the bottom of the eighth next for what they hope is the final time, leading Pacific seven to three. Rebels lead by four as we enter into the bottom of the eighth along with Dan Dolby, Matt Neverett here from Earl E. Wilson Stadium. The Rebels look for their second win in two days against Pacific to start the 2023 campaign. Squaring off against the sixth arm to toe the slab for Pacific, Jackson Ertz, the big right-hander, uh, formerly out of San Jose State, at two years at Mission College, the Danville, California native at six foot nine, 235 pounds. A direct over the top arm delivery, misses down and inside to Jacob Sharp. So you got 6-9 against 5-9 here. And Ertz, the big body, misses in the same spot. Two balls and no strikes. Ertz in behind Owen McWilliam, who recorded the final two outs in the seventh on two flyouts to left. In his first college pitching out. Ertz pitching for his third different school in five years. Rocks and delivers. Up and in, barely missing Jacob Sharp, who is hitless but has walked twice today. Ertz is a pretty imposing figure out there at 6'9 on that 21-inch uh, mound, but he's got a very slow and deliberate de delivery. Drops the glove. Long and high leg kick, and that one hits the jersey of Sharp. Sharp hit by a pitch. He works his way on via a free pass for the third time today. So for Sharp, after three hits yesterday in a walk, two walks and a hit by pitch today, He'll take it as the OBP is going to take a major spike here early in the season. And Darian Williams will bat with a runner on base here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Last year, in his first season at Pacific, Ertz spelled ERTZ 2-0 with a 21.32 ERA. Gave up 34 runs, 30 earned in just 12 and two-thirds innings. Looking to turn it around here in his second year at his third institution. 
Sharp held on at first as Williams waggles the bat above the right shoulder. Reaches outside the zone and pops it straight back. That's what we talked about yesterday with Kevin Higgins saying that the focus, at least early, has been keeping the hands inside the baseball and trying to stay through it. That one, Edarian just kind of fired it and just kind of poked the bat head out there. Yeah, the, he's chasing a ball off the plate right there, so his hands are not going to... The idea is to get the hands in front and the bat will follow. But on an outside pitch like that, it's too. the, the bat delivery is too late. Sharp fake to break from first as the breaking pitch nearly clubs Edarian Williams above the shoulders. He's able to turn away from it and as the count even at one and one, two for four today. Pretty good showing for Edarian Williams after he was one for four yesterday. So the idea is to get those hands through the plate with the bat following and keeping, keeping them extended, but outside the plate like that, you're getting your hands away from your body and you just can't generate any power that way. Ertz steps off the mound. Keeping an eye on the runner at first. He is the younger brother of Zach Ertz, the tight end of the Philadelphia Eagles who just fell in the Super Bowl. So he's got that NFL size. As after graduation, he wants to either be in an MLB or an NFL front office. Heck, he might be on an NFL or an MLB starting offensive line. Yeah, I know Pacific doesn't have uh, football, but he'd be a, a pretty good candidate to be a two-way player. His brother Zach has a Super Bowl ring from a couple of years ago. and. Very nearly got another one. I'll tell you what, we're a, a week and a half removed from the Super Bowl, but that was one of the more entertaining NFL championship games that I can remember. Runner breaks from first. Williams hits it in the vacated gap between the second baseman. Rounding second and into third is Sharp. A hit and run pulled off to perfection by Williams and Sharp here late in this one. And there's the aggressiveness that we were talking about, especially from Coach Hagan at third base, making that call to get the runner in motion easily. Sharpie gets into third base. So the third hit of the day for E. Darian Williams, and that one very nearly extra. The throw from the center fielder Bobo skipped past the base. Good job by both Ertz and the catcher Weiss of getting back behind the plate and limiting it to a 90-foot advancement. Sharp moves up 180 feet from first to third. Runners on the corner, still with nobody out for Austin Krizik. Rebels looking to break this one open against Ertz and Pacific. Yeah, being able to tag on a couple more here will give them some options in the bullpen if they don't bring Simon back out in the, in the top of the ninth. It's going to be a similar pitching plan to yesterday, it looks like. As Krizik takes a fastball high, one for three so far with the walk is the Rebel left fielder. Uh, yesterday, Noah Beal went four plus innings. Nick Rupp went the next four, and then Cole Roberts came in with the game almost out of hand. It, Got the side retired in the ninth inning. We'll see who comes in in the ninth if there is somebody in. As Krizik crushes this one to right. Deep enough for the runner on third. Sharp to tag up. No tag at first. The out may. The runner Sharp's going to score on what will be ruled a sacrifice fly to right field. So charge it as an RBI to Austin Krizik, who drove in three runs yesterday. Add one to that tally today. And add one to the lead as the Rebels now on top by a handful. The score eight to three. Yeah, and that uh, fifth uh, fifth run right there just gives you that luxury of making a really easier decision with pitching coming into the ninth. And as I look down at the bullpen right now, uh, it's gone inactive. So it looks like Simon at this point may be coming in to close it out. Simon's gone two and two-thirds innings very strong so far. In fact, he's retired eight of the last nine batters he's faced going through the order. Runner breaks the pitch, a called strike low in the zone. Williams in feet first and safely well ahead of the throw. So Darian, who stole six bases a year ago, gets on the board with his first of the 2023 campaign. Braden Murphy, one of those guys that's been a utility player from a defensive standpoint, but also his bat's going to be counted on this year. He's picked up a lot more strength with, through our strength and conditioning program. And uh, watching him in BP, he's putting some balls, he's getting some lead on it. Started to go around there, but holds up. Yeah, Murphy behind nothing and two, coming in as a defensive replacement for Cade Higgins, who was lifted after sliding into second base back in the sixth inning. Murphy pinch ran for him. This is his first trip around the lineup in which he will bat. Talk about the batting practice. He's one of the loudest in BP for sure. Williams off second base, a bouncing ball held near the plate by Jacob Weiss. That's a great job by the catcher of not only getting down to the knees and getting a chest in front of it, but getting over it. You're taught as a catcher to kind of angle it back towards the, the plate and the ground to not just stop it. If you keep your chest too upright, it can bounce away. You want to get on top and smother it like that. Well, the key, too, is getting that glove into the dirt. Right. And if you don't get it with the glove, you're going to take it off the middle of the body. Catcher's gear becoming more and more in terms of absorbing the, the contact. It's not, not what it used to be. 
lot more science goes into it nowadays. One two pitch put on the ground by Murphy to the right side, right at the second baseman Miller. Loves and throws to first in time. A 90 foot advancement from Williams moving from second to third. Murphy grounds out, but another insurance run 90 feet away for Alex Pimentel. Walks into the right hand batter's box now. Pimentel, after going one for two with a couple of walks and a hit by pitch last night, hit by a pitch and walked once each today, but he's also tripled and singled. He's driven in three runs as well. He's made a big impact at the dish. Field deep, Miller shading up the middle at second. That one inside, very nearly got Pimentel again. He's been hit by two pitches in two games, not necessarily how he thought he'd start his career in the scarlet and gray, but the on-base percentage and finding ways to just extend innings becoming such an important part of this lineup. Outfield shaded to pull as Pimentel squares to bunt, pulls it back on a pitch that's a called strike. That one, never any intent to bunt. With two outs and a runner on third, that's just to change up the look and give Ertz something to think about. Dots it square early on those and pull back late. Got to get in the catcher's way. 1-1 one, one pitch, hits him between the numbers 2-2. Two and two. Third time he's been hit by a pitch in two days. Second time today. So he's going to be black and blue after this weekend's over. But Pimentel stays perfect. He's reached base in all five plate appearances today. Yeah, not exactly what you're talking about. That's not the way he's looking to do it. But he crowds the plate. So he's going to get that, some of those, those inside pitches and take them and wear them. But you, you, you look at him the way he played last night and the way he played today. His, his on-base percentage is through the roof right now. Not, I don't, we don't have those stats pulled up right now. But that's what the Rebels are counting on him for. As Paul Myro takes a pitch down and outside. Well, just doing some quick math. Pimentel has been on base all five times today. He was on base four out of five times yesterday. That's 900 on base percentage through two games. Hey, you can take it any way you can get it. Not too bad. And, you know, when you get off to a hot start, even if you have a, a slump or a stretch in the middle of the season where you don't quite get on base as much, it looks a lot better because of the blazing fast start. Her watches up. Two balls and no strikes now from Ertz to Myro. And Ertz will call for a new ball as there is action behind him in the bullpen. Although with two outs, two runners on. I think Ertz, as well as the Pacific coaching staff, considering how many arms they've used already, hoping that he's able to retire the side and get out of dodge, limit the damage here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Dangles the ball by his side as he takes the side. Comes set with both hands coming together in front of the belt. Pimentel off first. Top of third is Williams. Pitch outside, moves the count to 3 0. Oh. So Myro likely watching all the way with the Darian, or rather, Johnny Horvat awaiting on deck. Williams on third, the outfield playing Myro to pull, just like they did for Pimentel. First baseman Casagrande keeping an eye on Alex Pimentel, although he's not going anywhere. Myro watching all the way. He took a called strike, knew it the whole way. Six foot nine. Jackson Ertz, it's a strike on the board, and the count goes three and one to Myro. This may be a situation, too, where we get a runner going from first base. Eight to three, the score. Myro looking to add on. It's that fastball, which he thought was inside for a called strike, two. 3-0 to 3-2. Ertz trying to come all the way back, and the Rebels just trying to add on however they can, up by five in the bottom of the eighth inning. Getting a little tough to see down there. The shadows have crept over from behind the press box here and the shade structure. So the plate is in complete shade right now with uh, the batter coming, the, the ball coming out of the pitcher's hand out of the bright sunlight. It's always really tough too when there's about half and half. Right now it's about 90 10 as far as sun to shade from the batter's perspective. Runner goes from first. Myro chops it left side. Tough play for the third baseman. Evans, his throw to first is just in time. An excellent stabbing grab at third and the throw even better. But the Rebels do add on one run on one hit. No errors and a pair of runners left on base. The Rebels hope they're done batting for the day. Trying to slam the door in the top of the ninth. Pacific will send the top of their lineup due up. Trailing by an 8-3 to three score when we return. Visit UNLVTickets.com to purchase your tickets today. 
forgot to change. So I forgot to change my watering clock. It's no big yeah. deal. I feel like my grass can use a few extra days of watering. No more excuses. Lake Mead is at historic lows. Water only one day a week in winter. It's the law. It all comes down to this in the top of the ninth inning. Sam Simon back out after going two and two thirds innings so far. He'll be up against one, two, three for Pacific with UNLV on top eight to three. So Simon, much like Rupp yesterday, eating up a ton of innings as the first man out of the bullpen. This is his first pitch is inside, backing John Howard Bobo off the plate. Bobo one for three with the walk, a single and a fielder's choice along with the ground out to third. Simon extending more so than we've seen in years past. Yeah, he was a one, maybe one and a half to two innings guy last year. But again, the maturity level, the confidence that he has in his pitching and the, the confidence more importantly from the coaching staff, you know, having him be able to finish this game is such an advantage going into tomorrow and the rest of the week. Breaking ball hit over the third, picked up at the belt line by Adarian Williams, throws a missile across the diamond and make it five straight batters set down by Sam Simon as the first out of the last inning. And while you hear a coaching adage, that's the toughest out to get in any ball game. Simon's made it look easy. He's only allowed two base runners now through three innings full, and one of them was on a fielder's choice on a ground ball up the middle. He's been uber efficient. They'll try to continue that against Chase Greaves, making his first plate appearance of the game. And the, the one hit he did give up was not a ball that was hit very hard. First pitch to Greaves, just above the chest for a called ball. And we were talking off air with some of the names that were brought up preseason as the top arms out of the bullpen. We really haven't seen any of them. And with one game tomorrow and then a tough non-conference matchup at Arizona State on Tuesday, this could be my design trying to get Rupp and Sam Simon to eat up some innings on the Friday and Saturday. Correct. It's a great problem to have, right? So, I mean, slated tomorrow t uh, is, is Acosta, Joey Acosta, but this actually gives them an opportunity seeing what uh, Pacific has had to go through nine pitchers, ten pitchers now through their lineup. So depending on what they have tomorrow, it gives the Rebels a chance to maybe bring somebody in and save Acosta for Tuesday night against ASU, which is non-conference, but that's a big rivalry for us, right? Absolutely. So a 2-2 count now from Simon to Greaves as he's set and dealing. Pop fly right side, Panaro fighting with the side, or rather Pimentel as he drifts towards the corner, and the right fielder Pimentel makes the catch. And now with two outs in the bottom, making the top of the ninth inning, Pacific down to their final out with their backs against the wall. They'll put it in the hands of Chaz Myers. Well, the names that they were that they had talked about were Selinger, Carbajal, Carbajal, and the older brother of Sam Simon, Zach Simon. We haven't seen any of them, and with the way that this series has gone, very likely won't need three arms out of the bullpen tomorrow. So they're done a great job already of preserving some of the relief core as Simon gets ahead of Myers with a called strike on a fastball. Myers 0 for 4 today. And, and we talked about ASU being a rivalry. It, it really is. And I think if my stats aren't wrong, I think we beat them nine out of the last ten times that we've played them. So playing a blue blood like Arizona State, it gives us a chance to talk about, you know, from a recruiting standpoint, hey, we play with the big boys, right? So it's just it, it, this pitching matchup is, is really interesting, but it's going to be a good problem to have. Swing and a foul ball straight back gives Pacific a nothing and two count down. So their final strike is Chaz Myers. Talking about the pitching, Beal went four plus yesterday. Rupp went four full. Cole Roberts slammed the door in the ninth today. It's just been Sharman who's in line for the win, and Simon. Simon one strike away from closing this game out with the score at eight to three. Round ball, left side. Fielded on the forehand by Darian Williams. Go to Murphy at first is in time. And how about Sam Simon? How about the Rebels as they move to 2-0 and with an 8-3 win? Simon was outstanding out of the bullpen today as the bats did enough for the win. This has been a good uh, start for the Rebels this season. And again, you're going to hear from the coaching staff today when we talk to them and tomorrow during BP. They're going to say, hey, we've wiped it clean. We're 2-0, and but we got to play 
a, a complete game on Sunday to get the series sweep. They're not looking just to win a series. They're looking to sweep a series. Yeah, the, the Rebels swept Pacific the last time they came out to early Wilson Stadium by scores of 8-4, to 3-2, to two, and 10 to nothing. After a 14-6 win yesterday, the Rebels closing out an 8-3 to five-run victory today as we run through our final line scores. The winning UNLV Hustlin Rebels, eight runs on just nine hits. They committed three errors defensively and left 12 men on base, so the damage could have been a lot worse. And Pacific, meanwhile, out-hit the Rebels with 10 hits. They were only able to plate the three runs, including two of them in the sixth. They committed one defensive miscue and left nine men on base as Josh Sharman gets the win to go to 1-0. Sharman went five and a third innings, three runs, only one of them earned, so the ERA still looking pretty sterling. Sharman gave up nine hits but spread them out with one walk while striking out four for the win. The loss goes to Quinlan Sweeney, who gave up four runs all earned on three hits, all in his one inning of work in the third. It was a lead that the Rebels would not relinquish. We played today in two hours and 43 minutes on a beautiful Saturday here in Southern Nevada as UNLV moves to 2 0. Pacific drops to nothing in two and sets up a series finale tomorrow, Stan, with the Rebels in the exact place that they want to be with both their lineup and their pitching staff. Absolutely, and we're not looking to see a get wins. We, Whoever is on the schedule is who we're going to play. Now, UOP is a young team. They're going to be struggling a little bit this year, coming off a, a really challenging uh, 2022. But the Rebels don't look at it that way. They're looking at, hey, we've got things that we're, uh, we're working on and we're rolling on, so we got to continue that momentum going through the Sunday finale. But it's uh, at this point, it's a great day to be a Rebel. An 8-3 to three win for UNLV over Pacific today. A probable pitching matchup tomorrow of Joey Acosta versus Marv Kasgarin. That game will start at 12.05 here on the West Coast. We want you to join us here at Early Wilson Stadium as UNLV looks to move to 11-0 in their last 11 against Pacific and 3-0 to start the 2023 season. For Dan Dolby, Sports Information Director Kelsey Olson, and everybody else here at UNLV Athletics, I'm Matt Neverett saying thank you for tuning in, and we'll be back at you tomorrow here from the Earl.